Alright. Well. I'm like way too excited. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. That's good. I'm, I'm glad you're excited to... I'm way too excited to die. <laughs> so, well, you may, you might live. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure. Because we're not, nice. like, being driven like cattle into the fucking slaughtering room or anything. Oh, it's a nice dinner. I don't know what you're you talking about. Valentina's excited. Right? It's a big opportunity. Mm-hmm. Great feast. To quote a, a, one of my favorite songs by Sarah Silverman, it's not cold in here, you're just dying. So, I... <laughs> I on that. Five minutes alone. Yep, basically. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're gonna... Um... I'm trying to mentally prepare myself to be licked. Like in a not in a pleasant way. TMI. <laughs> no. Um. Yeah, sure, Mr. Storyteller, because I'm not basing that off of anything. Well, no, I don't know what you're talking. <laughs> Jumping to God, conclusions. That was Lothar. That wasn't me. Uh, Such a scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I'd like to have a quick word. Uh, with you guys, if, if everyone's here, mm -hmm. everyone here. Missing. I don't know. Is Samantha disabled? back from the bathroom? Oh no, I don't think she is. So we can hang out for a minute. <laughs> Awkward silence and <laughs> No, uh, I am curious if 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 any of you guys have come to any realizations in the last week or so about your character. Well, I wrote them all to you, so I think mm -hmm. that says a lot. Oh, you did. Yes, I, I got all that. Like, realizations in the moment of, like, what's going on right now? Yeah, well, I mean, just having played your character for the first time, like, was your character less or more like you expected them to be? Hmm. I don't think enough opportunities have uh, shown themselves for Valentino to show his full colors or let me see how that goes yet. Um, so I'm going to see how that plays out. Yeah. yeah. Well, this next scene is a big one. And I, I did say, uh, as I was talking with Sam earlier, that I wanted to take my time with this next part coming up. Uh, because it's, you know, this is one of the more significant scenes of the whole story. Right. And I mean, um, we're in a kind of extreme situation as well, which I think, you know, kind mm -hmm. of compromises how everybody's acting, mm -hmm. like, depending on how they're going to act later. Because, of course, Saga's not going to... She, I built her to be really, you know, willpower, like, and, you know, really strong and not that shakable. But she's, you know, pretty scared right now because it's kind of extreme conditions. Because I played her a lot more scared than she'll probably be later. Right. All right, you back, Sam? No. No, she's not. I just realized I switched to my other accent. That's okay. You guys are having a bad influence on me. Cover is blown. I mean, I kind of, you know, I kind of switch back and forth whenever I feel like it. I can do a Swedish accent too, but that would sound horrible. <laughs> I don't even know if you guys would understand the words if I did that. <laughs> Probably not. Like, well, I guess you could PewDiePie, try. You know, he, I mean, PewDiePie has a pretty, has a pretty like. Thick speak not its name, Emily. Speak not its name. But like, he has a pretty thick no, accent. No, I'm speak, speak not its name. Not a fan. <laughs> no. Well, either way, he has an accent. <laughs> no, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think your accent is very. Nice. And people, people understand him. So obviously, Ooh. if I switch to, no. <laughs> if I if I switch to my Swedish accent, you might understand, but it might be some words that would get kind of weird. 
the hello? accent was not very pleasant, I would say. <laughs> She's so, back. I'm so, back. Yeah. Hello. Negative one experience. No. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Damn it, Sam. Get wrecked. So um, yeah, I, I, I did mention that I wanted to to just have a quick word with you guys about the about the game and um, the flow of the game so far. Um, it may a couple things. Let's see if I can remember what I want to talk to you about. See, I always remember driving home from work, but I when it's time to talk about it, I never do. It's always like that. Um, basically, uh, uh, what I wanted to get across to you guys is that this is you know what we're currently playing through. It's essentially a drawn out prelude. Um, you guys are still mortal, you're not vampires yet, uh, that sort of thing. It may feel very railroaded, this story at first. It may feel like you guys don't have a lot of options. And it may even feel that way a little later on. Uh, but I want you guys to remember that you do have options. It's just not always readily obvious to you. And there are many ways to go about things in the events to come. And I'm sounding very vague right now, but that's because I don't want to spoil you. Um, but it's the flow of the... Basically, your characters have no agency right now. Uh, you're pawns. And that's okay, because that's going to get us into the story. But the, the pace of the game is going to change as you guys get more freedom, as you get more choices. And you know what you're experiencing now is not in, indicative of the entire, uh, the entire chronicle. So I just wanted to remind you guys of that. Um, because it has been kind of very railroady. Especially last session. Like, we're going to the manor. Aren't you coming? Of course you are. Get in the carriage. <laughs> but I, think, I, I thought that set the um, I thought that set the mood really well. So I didn't really mind it. Yeah, it, it did. Um, so you guys are going to get more more choices and options. It's just, you know, you're you're still mortal right now. Like, I had creepy dreams afterwards, so that's a good thing. Nice. Did anybody else have nightmares? Oh! That, that hand scene was a little... I had to go wash my hands. But other than that... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so uh, let's get back into this, if everybody's ready. Mm-hmm. <coughs> ready. All right. Did everybody switch over to their characters in the drop-down menu on the lower right-hand side? Everybody do that. Oh, good call. All right, cool. Yep. I was done. Oh. Okay. So one second, I'm going to get my notes. Is Scott here? No. We don't, we don't need Scott. It's fine. <laughs> Scott! <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's not here. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, you guys are you guys are clueless. Come on, I don't hear Scott. I'm here. Oh, hi, Scott. I, hi. I never doubted you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Daniel's like maybe he's not here. I'm like, uh. All right. That wasn't that wasn't doubt. That was just a realization. <laughs> you were just like, does no, nobody see the problem with this? And we're like, nah. That wasn't a doubt. It was just realization, said Judas to Jesus. Anyway. Uh... <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, let's do it. All right. I'm even here. <laughs> Stone face. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> We open our scene with a lavish banquet hall that the six of you have emerged into. The feast hall is decorated with fresh flowers and banners of silk, and also the house banners of House Giovanni suspend on the on the stone walls around you. Uh, there are crenellations in the stone walls which suggest a very fortified room and yet it has been dressed up quite nicely for this uh, for this banquet this evening and yet there's no food that you can see there's no
Are you sick today, Sam? You sound a bit stuffed. Out of character analogies. comments to a minimum, please. All right, so we're gonna get back into this. Um, and as you enter into the room and step forward as Lothar is leading the group of you, um, we're gonna go around, the camera's gonna shift and we're gonna see uh, each character and their reaction to this, to this room as uh, we glance briefly at uh, Valentino. Valentino, Valentino, looks over at the musicians and kind of furrows an eyebrow um, kind of shakes it off um, he looks around the room and he's looking for the seat closest to Claudius the seat closest to Claudius is uh, certainly empty uh, and he and several of your hosts have risen and that's something you notice right away Valentino that there are empty seats next to each of the hosts and as they rise to greet you, uh, and the six of you walk forward, the camera is going to shift uh, now to Julietta. Um, Julietta is kind of um, taking in the sight of the musicians, and then um, eventually she lets her eyes roam back to... Uh, Claudius and the others <clears throat> she's kind of thinking this whole situation is very strange she you know in the beginning thought that she was here um, just for Lord Giovanni and now she's seeing that um, not only did these other guests who were invited come along with her on this journey but there are other people here at this dinner and um she is a little bit taken aback by how many individuals are in this room um but she tries to remain calm her composure is intact and um she would if she's uh rather close to the lord when he stood and he spoke she she would again kind of bow in his direction and um stand poignantly after that and um, be at attention of what's going on next. And as Julietta bows in his direction, we look at Saga, who is very near to where she is standing. I've got to take a very, very, very small step back. She's very hesitant about this whole situation. And as you do, Saga, you immediately notice a certain quality about your hosts. Um, go ahead and make a perception awareness roll. All right. A secret one? Yes, it's mental. All right. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot to open the browser, so I'll open the PDF. Uh, oh. <clears throat> Do you need a, a link to your character sheet? Yeah, because I've, I've, I forgot the link. I still have the PDF, but the PDF is a little bit slow. Okay. And tends to freeze my computer a little bit, like it did right now, because I can't do shit right now. <laughs> okay, there's your character sheet. Yeah, my computer does not like PDFs. Um, so, my hands are trying right <laughs> Okay, now it's loosening up. There we go. Um... What was I supposed to roll? Uh, perception awareness. Oh, all right. All right. All right, and as Saga takes a step back, we look at Garman. Garman is still um, eyeing the room that he has entered. Um, He's still panning over the band as if um, something is wrong, but he continues to scan the dining room um, and the people that have um, started to walk forward to greet them. And as Garman steps forward, we look at Diego. This whole situation is very strange, and Diego doesn't have much care for this 
Giovanni fellow. He's looking to the others, seeing if they're guests like him, if there's any sign of compassion or friendliness in their eyes, or if he's just entered a den of vipers, as he suspected. There is certainly something eerie about your hosts. Go ahead and roll a perception awareness, Diego. And as you look around the room, Diego, and as all of you have your various reactions, German, you feel Mariana kind of instinctively hide just a bit behind you as she seems to have taken to you for some reason, still clutching at your arm. And you see behind, standing behind Claudius Giovanni are three men and two women, clearly servants, and yet all of them are dressed in white linen robes which are plain and nondescript and fairly simple. And they're robes that are irrespective of their sex. As they move around carrying, uh, one of them carries a, um, a platter of uh, goblets. And she, she moves forward and, and allows each of you to take a glass of wine. And as, <clears throat> excuse me, as each of you take a glass of wine and, and she moves back. Do, well, actually, let me ask. Does anyone not take a glass? Garvin will not take a glass. He will wait for off. Valentino uh, gladly takes one. Okay. Yeah, I'll take it, but I won't, I, I, won't, I won't drink. Garvin, go ahead and roll uh, your perception etiquette. And as the servant passes you by, uh, what does Garman do? Um, Garman will uh, have hang his head down and, and look up, and, and he'll he'll slowly grab a cup from the from the servant as she passes. And hesitantly, as the crusader does so, Giovanni says, uh, spreading his arms wide. Let us toast the most memorable meal of your lives. Here's to the finer things in life. And he lifts his own glass and begins to drink. I am not sure, Master Giovanni, Diego says. He's smiling, though. I've had some pretty good dinners. Lord Giovanni looks over at you, Diego, and smiles. Just a bit too wide, you think. Valentina raises a cup and says, To our gracious host. Julietta would do the same. She uh, would lift her cup and repeat after Valentino, To Lord Giovanni. And she would smile and uh, take a sip. And what is Saga doing? going to bring the cup to her lips but she's um she's not going to actually drink anything it's going to like be a fake out that's what she's going to try to do and you notice mariana taking a tentative sip anyone who is looking in her direction and as you do giovanni says ah of course <laughs> forgive me yes i forgot to introduce your host this evening my companions and friends very old friends. Here, and he motions to the first lady, first to his left. This is Lady Yadviga Olmanov, and he motions to her, and she rises. Um, 
You notice right away that she is a very uh, serious woman with dark red hair. She's uh, very heavy set right away. Has one of those unfortunate figures that appears as though someone has wrapped twine about her body to keep her fat from spilling out of the completely black dress she's wearing. She appears bohemian in her features. You can see that she's certainly from this area. And what little jewelry she wears is tasteful and elegant. Her fair skin is utterly smooth, though. She gives a simpering, jowled smile at the gathering of you. Welcome, she says in her thick local accent. Ah, and this, Claudius says, motioning to his right. This is the fearsome warrior Marquetus the Bold of the local, the local people here in Bohemia. And a tall, broad-shouldered man with a thick, dark beard. Uh, Marquetus, he rises from his uh, seat and uh, folds his arms across his chest, looking over the six of you. He's, he's a, definitely a powerful example of manhood with uh, enormous arms, and uh, he wears a battered but well-oiled leather armor. It's clearly been cared for, and, and clearly not the only one to wear armor to dinner tonight, as... Uh, he is looking over the six of you with uh, a faint scowl, and his face is painted in almost a pagan style, uh, which is somewhat surprising. And over here we have uh, Sire Winchestless. Yes, rise, Winchestless. And he motions to a man who is sitting at the far edge of the table, who also rises and gives you uh, gives the six of you a faint smile. He's definitely a, a weathered old man, but he's dressed extravagantly in a royal purple tunic, leggings, and a feathered cap. Winchestless uh, gives uh, a look at the six of you, which is very intriguing and alternatively aloof. Um, he flaunts his extravagant wealth, definitely dripping with elegant and expensive jewelry. And more than anyone else in this room, he glitters against the torchlight and the soft candelabra. Uh, he folds his hands together in a kind of a steeple and looks the six of you over. And this, uh, yes, my lady, if you would. And Giovanni reaches over and uh, extends his hand to a, a, a slender, tall woman child of about 16. She rises from her seat and you see that um, she has uh, a short tangle of jaw-length dark hair and is certainly the most unkempt person in this room. She's wearing a soiled silk gown that is definitely a splotchy with uh, what appears to be dirt uh, that is torn in several places. Her hair is adorned with rotting uh, flowers. This is Lady Theophana, and he, Claudius, uh, smiles at the six of you, and, and Theophana looks at the six of you with uh, a very far away look in her eyes, very distant, and there's something... Uh, Something about her that seems as though she's not quite fully here. And last but not least, of course, and Claudius motions to the uh, other far end of the table. Uh, you note as far away from Sire Vincestless as possible, although you have no idea why that would be significant. This is Lady Demetra, and he motions, and Lady Demetra rises. She is a, um, a tall, sinewy woman, very curious of her sex, who seems to be dressed more like a man. Uh, she moves with a kind of confident, measured precision. You think that perhaps she has spent a, a great deal of her life outdoors. She's athletic and well-muscled, uh, although her skin seems smooth and pale, just as the gentler sex should. She has wide almond eyes that are bright and alert, and she takes in all of the six of you with uh, a studious glance. And as, uh, oh, she's also wearing a, a traveling cloak, curiously, which the hood is currently lowered. Um, she's not wearing a dress, which is very curious. Instead, a uh, man's breeches. We would know you better, Claudius says to the six of you as he motions. And he motions for the six of you to come closer and, and to uh, um, mingle in the room as, as some of the others have already begun to walk around the table and, and approach, uh, approach you. Conversation is like fine wine, he reminisces as he swirls the liquid in his glass, looking it over. It enhances the appetite. Let us converse while we anticipate our dinner. The camera is going to shift to first to um, uh, let's 
see. Valentino. Valentino is going to uh, look over in Saga's direction and uh, kind of put a hand out in an inviting way and say, Come, my lady, let us join the feast. You're putting your hand out too? Saga, with the ah, palm up. I see. Well, I mean, it'd be rude to not take it, so she's going to take it. But under her breath, she does mumble that... Um, and as uh, Saga takes your hand, Valentino, where do you lead her? I'll lead her over to the um, the banquet table and find if there are two open seats, uh, preferably in the center of the action, like in the middle of uh, a group of them. I'll try and find two seats there if it's possible. And as you approach the table, you find you're immediately intercepted by the woman who was introduced by, as Lady Yadviga Olmanov. She's the uh, heavyset woman wearing the long, flowing black gown. She approaches you when you're holding the hand of, uh, of Saga, and she smiles. Ah, what a handsome young man you are. She reaches out and even touches your face uh, vaguely in a, a commanding tone as she allows her index finger to slip beneath your chin and adjusts your uh, posture just somewhat before withdrawing her hand. It happens happening so quickly that you hardly any, had any time to react. And is this your escort for the evening, my lady? Lady Advaga shifts to look at you, Saga. I would suppose so, my lady. Well, clearly he needs a real woman. And immediately Lady Yadviga slips her arm into his and pulls him away from you. <laughs> Valentina's kind of looking behind him as he gets pulled away. Unclear. Come, my dear. Lady Yadviga wraps a, a, a thick, doughy arm around you, kind of pressing you to her uh, immense weight and um, pulling, kind of pulling you off and, and ushering, ushering you uh, against the far end of the table and we have much to discuss. You have the look of one who has good breeding. And you notice Saga's Lady Yadviga um, begins to walk away with, uh, with him, that her, her glittering jewelry uh, adorned fingers are stroking against his back. Valentino, how are you taking in this very forceful woman? Uh, Saga will mumble, do my gosh. Uh, Valentino is very... Uh, uncomfortable with how how forward and direct this woman is being with him. He's never encountered a woman this uh, aggressive. So he's kind of he's kind of shaken and not really sure how to take the situation because it's new to him. And the can it is very uh, a completely new experience for you. You've never met a woman with such uh, with such aggressive tendencies. It's it runs current or it runs concurrent against all your experiences with the fairer sex. And yet, as she leads you off, uh, Lady Yadviga is um, certainly not the sort of woman you might have pursued on your own. But there is something commanding about her, despite her um, unkempt or not unkempt, but uh, shall we say soft living uh, or the, the body that soft living has given her. Tell me, young man, what are you from? You have an Italian look about you. Yes, my lady, I am from Genoa, Italy. Ah, uh, Genoa, such an enchanting city. I visited it some time there before. Come, have a seat. And she sits down and motions to the seat next to her. She does so, and the camera follows Lady Yadviga and Valentino. And she's motioning to the seat next to hers. She okay. Takes seat. Um, Valentino follows and takes a seat, kind of reluctantly and looking around. But he, he sits. He sits with her. She's examining you. Tell me something interesting about you. A man should always be interesting. Don't you agree? I very much agree. I would say the most interesting thing about me is my travel experience. As a Divala merchant, I have crossed a fair amount of Europe, perhaps places you have not been to, my lady. That's kind of a confident, arrogant look. Immediately, uh, she looks amused. A worldly man? 
That is interesting. I have not uh, spoken with many men who have traveled in such length and depth of Christendom. Hmm. She reaches over and simpers a bit. There's a decanter of expensive, what appears to be expensive alcohol, as you've uh, had much like it before, and yet as she removes the stopper, the aroma that immediately uh, fills the air is enticing. It looks like a quite expensive brandy, and she immediately takes the glass from your hand that you had uh, sipped from before. This is not worthy of you. And she immediately tosses the wine to the floor, and it, it splatters across the stone before filling the glass with her own drink. I import this from the Orient. Quite delicious and rare. Leaders deserve only the best. Don't you agree? And she passes you the glass. I heartily agree, my lady. He takes the glass and drinks from it happily. And as you drink this, Yadviga is looking at you, she's studying you, and you can't help but feel a little uncomfortable under her heavy gaze. I like you. And what is your name? My name is Valentino Divala, of the Divala Merchants of Genoa. Yes. I thought you had breeding in you. Not nobility, of course, but there is a certain presumptuousness about you that excites me. You seem like a man among men, a leader. What I should wonder is your father like, or his father? My father, I would say, is much like me, an ambitious man who has created a small empire that continues to grow, and his father before him began it. I should say we have a strong lineage of pioneers in the silk business. Indeed. You, you seem... Hmm. I do not know what the word is. High birth and genteel breeding are not the most telling virtues, though they, they are important indeed. Inner nobility, that is what I think I see in you. And the will to command others are far more important. I have met many an ineffectual and useless noble in this country, and more than a few fine leaders who were born of mean station. Would you describe yourself as one or the other? I would describe myself as a man exactly in the station he needs to be to do what needs to be done and complete his goals. Yadviga gives you a faint smile. Oh, we shall soon see, won't we? And as she says this, the camera is going to shift as we look across the room to where Germain is standing. What has Germain begun to do as everyone mills about and is beginning to interact as you see the crowd begin to form and, and discuss? Yes, I was abandoned in the middle of the fucking room, yeah. Yes, you do see Lady Yadviga taking Valentino immediately. Um, Germain is um, scanning the, the patrons and the hosts, um, but he's going to lock eyes over at uh, Giovanni and move over to... Um, their host, Claudius. And Mariana comes with you as though um, not knowing what else to do. And immediately as she arrives, uh, Lord Giovanni turns to look at you. Ah! Our... Excuse me. Our representative of the church. Uh, Lothar said something about your name. It escapes me. Now, what is your name? Claudius is looking at you uh, like someone who is mildly drunk, smiling. I am German de Gascoigne. That was the name. Ah, and such a flower you have brought with you. And immediately German looks down at Mariana, and you feel Mariana shrink almost somewhat, wilting a bit beneath his gaze as he reaches out and takes her by the hand and with a, a tug that is far too forceful for your liking, pulls her almost from your side and Mariana kind of follows him, and her eyes are fixed up at him as he looks down at her. Yes, you are the guest I had request for this evening. Mariana, did you enjoy my jewelry, my fine silks? His, he lifts a finger and begins to stroke his uh, glistening fingernail across the uh, fine threads of her dress, just against her shoulder where it begins to touch flesh, and she stammers, unable to articulate a response. Um, in an attempt to uh, 
kind of interrupt this unchivalrous manner. He's going to uh, kind of pipe up. And <clears throat> Mr. Claudius Giovanni, I believe we have business before. Any motions to the room? Pleasures. Claudius turns away from Mariana, who appears grateful for her moment of respite and looks at you. Business. I know business. I'm quite good at business. What is this that you speak of on such a night as this? I speak of your men that you sent with Sir Lothar to greet us the other night. I have witnessed a murder. They a murder? Murdered. They have murdered a local clergyman by the name of Brother Clement. I found his body in his, in his dying breaths. I watched them carry him away and beat him. I would have the church's justice. Claudius listens to your tale with uh, what appears to be detached interest, uh, smiling faintly, but his smile is just very, very distant as he listens. Ah, so unfortunate. Well, you understand, German, that my men are perhaps overzealous. Did they have a reason or did they just set upon this man? Uh, Garman considers the question for a moment. The man was out speaking towards your men. And while he was a bit drunk at the time, perhaps nothing can justify the beating of a man of the church, of the cloth, and of God. Claudius's arm has slipped around Mariana's waist as you continue to talk and pulled her closer to him. Yes, of course, Gammon. I am very sympathetic to your concerns. Do you know which men were involved? Um, Giovanni try or uh, uh, Garman tries to think back about the two foot soldiers that he had sent with Lothar. And before giving you a chance to answer, Claudius waves a hand. It is no matter, Lothar, and he snaps his fingers immediately, and Claudius. For being a rather shorter man, he has a way of commanding as his voice immediately carries across the room, and, and some even look as he beckons uh, his steward. Lothar immediately comes running and, and stands and, and bows very low at the waist as he presents himself. My lord. Lothar, this churchman tells me that your men set upon a, a what was it, a priest, a monk? A monk, Brother Clement. Yeah, uh, what do you know of this? Lothar immediately looks, uh, not concerned or, or affrighted as you thought a servant uh, being, um, having to answer before his lord might be. In fact, he, he gives a somewhat gleeful smile. Yes, well, my lord, the... The monk was saying some regrettable things about your noble person. We could not permit such a disrespectful tone to prevail before your most esteemed guests. And he, of course, keeps his head bowed while speaking this. And Claudius thinks for this for a moment. Yes, but of course you should have reined in your men a bit more. This is the church we're talking about, isn't it, Lothar? Ah, yes, of course, my lord. Forgive me. A thousand apologies. You're forgiven. Claudius waves at and give them over to German's tender ministrations. We have facilities downstairs. There is a most loving dungeon. There, with all the equipment you will need to determine the truth of this. Is this satisfactory, Sir German? Uh, Garen thinks for a moment at, at how um, quickly he was to forgive Lothar for uh, the command of his men and his unchivalrous behavior, but he he understands that he's here to get justice for Brother Clement, so he quickly nods and, yes, this will do just fine. Thank you, Lord Giovanni, as he bows his head low. Claudius gives you a smile. Oh, you're very welcome, churchman. Lothar, have your men find the ones responsible and 
give them over to the hospitality of the rooms below. And at this moment, you hear a rough voice behind you, Garman, as uh, you look over and you see the one that was introduced as Marquettis says, Now I would see what this churchman does with these offenders. Do you have plans for them, churchman? As he looks over at um, Marquettis, you said? Yes, Marquettis has approached you from behind, and he circles around to stand just off a bit to where you're uh, speaking with Lord Giovanni. Um, he, he looks the, the very um, massive, uh, imposing man over. Of course, they will receive to God's justice after, as he kind of pauses for a moment, confession. <laughs> I would love to see the confession torn from their bloody lips by this man. Come. I would join you. And without even saying so much as a word, uh, Claudius, who is sort of uh, husbanding a, a little smile, looks between Marquettis and then back to you. Of course you have no objection. Yes, German. Of course not. And it, at that moment, uh, he um, motions to Lothar, who turns to uh, apparently run off and, and give the order. Marquettis, I'm sure you know my estate, where the rooms are below. You'll show our churchmen there, won't you? Marquettis gives a faint scowl, of course. And he turns and immediately begins walking uh, towards the, the large doorway, which is branching off of the main uh, feast hall. Do you follow after him? Um, yes, Garman will follow after a, a brief bow of the head towards Giovanni, and then he's going to linger a moment on Mariana, um, knowing the situation he's leaving her in, um, and he's going to linger a bit longer on her, and then he's going to slowly bow his head towards her and then follow after Marquettis. And as you walk away, the last thing that you see of Mariana is a pleading look in her eyes, a silent um, cry for help as you see Lord Giovanni's wrinkled but pale fingers tighten somewhat around her shoulder and pull her a bit closer to his side. And yet, that is not your concern at the moment. You think that, uh, well, actually, what is, what is he thinking as he follows Marquettis? Um... He's, he is thinking regrettably about leaving Mariana in the, the company of such unchivalrous people. Um, clearly, he shares a taste with Lothar that he's not so quite fond of. Um, but now is the time for justice, and he's, he's on a mission for the church. He cannot be burdened with these things. And as Garman and Marquettis leave the feast hall, the camera is going to shift uh, to Diego to see where he has inserted himself into this social situation and who he chooses to approach and speak to. Diego's taking his time with this one. He's been standing in a rather uh, casual pose, drinking his wine. He did intend to speak to Marquettis. He envies the man's physique and wanted to know about his uh, wartime activities, but... Seeing as he's been taken away by Gehrman, that lout of a man, he decides maybe instead that he might get some conversation from the Lady Theophana. He wants to avoid Wenceslas with all his might, though. That man looks like a fop. And as you cross the room to uh, towards Lady Theophana, uh, what is Diego doing? I, I, I guess what I meant to say was, how does he intend to approach Lady Theophana? He tends to approach her as a gentleman might, keeping his distance and introducing himself first with a bow. Lady Theophana is not paying particular attention to you, and you have to uh, clear your throat somewhat to get her to look in your direction as she uh, looks up at you. There's something very wild and unkempt about her. Her hair is a bit uh, everywhere, and yet there's something very beautiful about the sort of chaos that she has about her, the rotting flowers and the torn gown as she looks you over with uh, wide eyes. Ah, hello. What is your name? 
My name, milady, is Diego Vasquez de Sevilla. And he bows to her. <laughs> what a mouthful that is! How will I ever be able to pronounce it? If you wish, milady, you may just simply call me Diego. 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 Hmm. That has a pleasant tongue. What are you doing here, Diego? I was invited, my lady. As was I. See, we already have something in common. Won't you join me, Diego? I don't think that's necessary. A voice immediately catches your attention, Diego, as you look over, and the one man that you had intended to avoid approaches as you see Saya Venceslas has inserted himself between you and Lady Theofana, or perhaps at least into the conversation. The older man, he appears to be in his 60s, is glittering with jewelry and uh, uh, deep, sumptuous purple velvet as he approaches you and, and looks you over. Lady Theofana, you won't mind if I discuss something of menly, gentlemanly matters with your new friend, will you? Lady, Lady Theofana giggles. Venceslas. Oh, not at all, not at all. How is Diego reacting? He tries to stay poised, but he can't help his eyes from rolling up toward the ceiling a bit. Ah, yes, you. I noticed you right away, Venceslas says, looking at you and standing there as uh, Lady Theofana also watches the exchange. His royal purple tunic is immaculate, and despite his old and withered appearance, he appears to have done everything he can to make himself look as presentable as possible. As he uh, reaches out, and as if to touch you, but he doesn't quite, and he withdraws his hand. Ah, yes. Hmm. You, what, what is your name? I, I think I heard you tell the uh, Lady Theofana, but I, I missed it. You know, old ears. He grins. Diego puffs out his chest a bit to steal himself. Diego Vasquez de Sevilla, sir. Ah, a Spaniard. It has been such some time since I've spoken with a Spaniard. What part of Spain do you hail from, Diego? La Sevilla, senor. La Sevilla. Wonderful, wonderful. And do you have an art, Diego? Do you have a craft? Do you have the hunted look of an artist? That I do, sir. I am an architect. And I've also studied law in Bologna. Wonderful. Tell me about your art. Have you built anything? Have you imagined anything wonderful? Ah, now. Diego settles down immediately. Someone at, le at last to be his audience. He clears his throat and begins telling Wenceslas whether he wants to hear it or not about his many ideas for the city of Sevilla. And Venceslas, he, he listens to you quite interestingly, and his eyes glitter with fascination as he, uh, it, it, at some point, he, he actually reaches out and, and touches your leg, and, and uh, as the two of you actually retire, and, and he takes a seat with you as you continue to talk, and he, uh, during animated moments when you're speaking of something most interesting, he'll, he'll reach out and he'll, he'll touch your leg, or he'll... Um, He'll sit back, or he'll lean forward, interested, with his wrinkled face and his bright eyes. Yes. You, you, I knew that you were special the minute I laid my eyes upon you. Diego, you are, have you a patron, Diego? Unfortunately, no, senor. That is unfortunate. That is tragic. And he reaches out and cups your face in his withered hands, and his hands feel like paper, and yet they're so cool. You are most lovely. You have special qualities that call to me. You are... I do not know what you are. Well, would you be willing to... And his eyes wander, and he's looking off in the distance, and you, as you follow your eyes, or follow his eyes, Diego, for this man is quite captivating, despite his weathered appearance. There's something about him that kind of domineers your attention. He's looking in the direction of where Saga is standing, 
freshly divested from her male companion in Valentino. What is Saga doing as the camera shifts to her? She's gonna look back at uh, Julieta to see if she's still standing there. Like, try to locate her at this point. And you see, Diego, that Saga is looking around the room as if looking for someone. Yes! There! Then Chesless points a withered finger in Saga's direction. I would know if she was an artist as well. Come, Diego, come. Let us introduce ourselves to the poor and lonely lady. He rises from his seat and, and beckons that you do as well. Diego does, for despite himself, and despite not wanting to like this man, he discovers that he actually does. Yes, follow me. Men, gentlemen, such as ourself, of of high sophistication must always deign to reach out to the fair sex. Oh, she's so young looking, isn't she? And he walks after and approaches Saga with you at his side. Hello, young lady. And you hear his voice, Saga, uh, that kind of withered and yet somewhat uh, intriguing voice as you um, are looking around for Julieta. Well, yes, but I, I get a bit startled if, because, of course, I was looking for her, and now they're coming up to me. Oh, uh, my lord, I'm so sorry my attention was elsewhere. Ah, yes. Oh, I am Sia Chesless. I'm so pleased to meet you. How old are you? You look just on the cusp of pubescence. <laughs> that is, um, that is awfully kind of you, my lord. I, uh... I am 24, though, I'm afraid. Or 23, and but 24 soon. At this, Sire of Chestless, his nose wrinkles somewhat and his eyes tighten in a look of stern disappointment. Oh, I don't believe that at all, young lady. You're just on the cusp of 15, aren't you? Don't lie to me now. And he reaches out and strokes a withered finger just underneath your chin. Look at that face, that lovely, youthful exuberance about you. Clearly, you have just had your first blood. She looks like very like, what the fuck did he just say? I, uh... Y you, um... You flatter an old widow, but I'm afraid to disappoint you. Oh, not at all. I know young ladies when I see them. And you are most certainly that. What do you think of my companion here, Diego? What do you think? How old is she? Senor, I'm sure I don't know. But she is beautiful, is she not? Yes, of course, you're an architect, not a sculptor. But architecture is really just the study of buildings that are not flesh. Shall we discuss flesh in a more intimate setting, my friends? And at this most... At this moment, when Chesless, he actually slips an arm around your waist, Diego, and an arm around your waist, Saga. I mean, Saga's just kind of, like, horrified, but she's not gonna, you know, do anything about it, because this guy's creepy. Yes, of course, let us retire to a more intimate setting. I have chambers reserved for such fascinating and youthful individuals as yourself. And Simon Chesless goes on as he begins to gently guide and push you in the direction of... Oh, uh, oh but my lord, I, uh, I do not know if that is, if that is appropriate. Oh, speak Sorry, not of appropriate, woman. young lady. You have to pay attention to your elders and heed them now, don't you? And he taps your nose with his finger. <laughs> I, I realize this, my lord, but it is, at least in the north, it is very scandalous for an unwed woman oh, to Oh, now, 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 alert. now, you just be quiet, young lady, and listen to Sire Venceslas. Now, come, come, and he, he's actually very forceful in his, uh, as he, he's, he actually tightens his arm around your waist and leads you along rather like a grandfather might a small child. She's gonna look over to Diego and be like, nah, I'm gonna fix this. <laughs> And what is Diego doing? He doesn't seem to know what to do. He gives Saga a very apologetic look. That, but, but one that almost says, just go with it. Ah, yes, of course. Now we should 
we shall discuss in, in more length, more private matters. Things most left uh, not for the dinner table, shall we say. And as Venceslas goes on and on, leading the two of you away, the camera is going to shift away from Venceslas to Julieta, where she stands uh, unfound, where Saga had been looking for her, as she only had a moment or two to look, as we look at Julieta and see how she is taking in this uh, this crowd. You see, Julieta, that some are leading others off and others are beginning to pair off. You see uh, a very familiar social situation, although your experience at court has told you that the hosts are definitely the more aggressive ones, as they seem to take command of the guests right away. Some are leading others off, and you can see right away that Valentino has fallen into the clutches of that very bulbous woman. And of course, there is that withered old man who is leading off uh, Diego and Saga as well as you take in this room. What do you do? Well, Julieta did not notice that Saga was um, was looking for her. She she has taken in everyone and and where they have gone, but her her main focus has been on um, Lord Giovanni. Is he is he still in the the dining hall? Yes, he is. He's actually standing in the middle of uh, well. He's standing behind the uh, table in the middle where he had been sitting, and um, he's actually looking at Mariana and speaking something uh, to her. You can see his interest in her is quite fixed, and it causes a a bolt of panic to go through you as though uh, his eye has already fallen on a young woman. Um, yes, definitely. She she has taken in that Lord Giovanni has taken a likeness to the... Um, the the peasant girl, because we can see that she was, in fact, a peasant, yes? We... Almost certainly. She she looks as though she's never been to court in her life, and she's very awkward and ungainly. And Julietta notices this. Um, and everything she has worked for to this point is kind of um, hanging on a cliff. So, of course, when she looks off from the others and sees this... Um, she immediately pulls herself back to why she is here. Um, and standing there rather poised, she composes her um, fears and begins to glide over to the two of them. <clears throat> you just catch the tail end of something in Italian that Giovanni is saying to her, and yet it is uh, quickly cut off as he glances up and notices your approach. Hello. And what is your name, young lady? Um, immediately when she um, steps forward, she would bow once more in his direction. And softly she would say, <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. I <laughs> she would say, My lord, I am Julieta. Ah, yes. You were the one that Lothar looked for, sent the invitation to in Italy. Oh, it's been some time since I've been home. From what part of Italy do you hail, Julietta? Florence, my lord. And you immediately notice that Mariana in his grasp has not seemed to be faring well under his attention. She looks very pale and almost glassy-eyed as she is not looking at you. She's almost staring off into the distance. Giovanni doesn't seem to notice at all. Florence, I have visited on an occasion. What an ancient and fair city. Perhaps more ancient than fair, though. <laughs> she smiles, um, and she does notice that Mariana is um, looking somewhat uncomfortable and awkward um, with Giovanni's arm kind of wrapped around her. And you notice that his fingers are stroking slowly, almost sensuously, over her dress that she is wearing. <clears throat> she she kind of takes note of that, but she looks back uh, full-heartedly into Lord Giovanni's eyes, and, and um, she sort of tries to begin working her little magical charms on him. Um, her, her right hand would kind of touch with her fingertips at his his um, adjacent arm and she would begin speaking softly to him my lord would you mind taking a circle around the room with me I would love to hear what you know of my city 
Oh, well. Hmm. Go ahead and roll your manipulation subterfuge difficulty eight. <clears throat> this is public, right? Yeah, it's a social role. Everybody can see what you're doing if, if they're looking at you. Come on, Sam. Save her. <laughs> you can roll that 10 again. How do you roll 10s again? Just... Just hit the 10 again button. Oh... And as you reach out and touch his arm, uh, Lord Giovanni looks you over and you see interest definitely appear in his glittering eyes. Up close there is something uh, something about Lord Giovanni that you immediately notice is off. You he's not he's not the sort of man you expected him to be. Although in appearance he looks much like an elderly lord in his 40s, uh, you know, slightly wrinkled countenance and he's a bit short not wholly unattractive but certainly not handsome and despite that there is something very commanding about his eyes and the way they glitter in the dim light of the feast hall and the heart the, there's a certain marble about his features and that makes you think of the statues that you saw back home as he examines you and looks you over you you more than ever, you feel like something to be consumed as he seems to be evaluating you. I don't think that would be too amiss, but I must leave Mariana here to do so. Well, however, will she fare without me? She is, of course, unaccompanied this evening. Julietta will <clears throat> kindly smile to uh, Mariana and say, Oh, but my lord, I don't believe you give this young girl enough credit. Oh, how so? He looks amused now. <clears throat> she smiles. Well, as you say, she is quite beautiful. I'm sure she could make many friends here. All of your hosts seem very welcoming. <laughs> he begin, immediately breaks out into laughter as Mariana looks very faint. She looks uh, as though she didn't quite hear what you were saying. She's kind of staring off into the, the space glassy-eyed, not looking like anyone who would fare well on their own. <laughs> indeed, indeed. She is uh, as pure as this land has to offer. That was my interest in her initially, but purity can be overrated, can't it? Um, Julietta kind of gives Lord Giovanni somewhat of a small smirk. Um, she isn't. She isn't quite sure if she if he knows who she is, meaning what she is and her profession, but. Um, she does sort of give him a knowing glance uh, that she agrees with his his thoughts on that. Hmm. Let us see if we can consult one on these matters more experienced than I. And he reaches over and motions, beckons with a finger, more accompanied to or more accustomed to nobility than perhaps you have ever been across the room to someone and as you look over you see that he is motioning to Lady Theophana of all people and you can't help but feel somewhat surprised that he would invite her into this conversation and you can't help but feel a little disappointed as it seemed to have been going so well that another woman would enter your arena this woman child Lady Theophana rises from her seat and smiles tilting her chin downward and looking at Lord Giovanni as she walks her legs scissoring with every step as she approaches the three of you Lord Giovanni she says with interest looking at you and then 
first to him and then to you, Julieta. Lady Theophana, we were just discussing corruption and purity. And what do you see in these two lovely young ladies? Who do you think I should accompany this night? Lady Theophana is looking first at Mariana and then to you as she examines you. What is uh, Julieta doing as Theophana joins the conversation and now appears to be examining you, asked for her opinion? And you wonder why uh, uh, such a young girl would have an opinion at all in the matter. Oh, Julieta is holding her tongue. Um, when she sees Lady Theophana coming towards them, um, she doesn't feel very threatened by this girl. I mean, her appearance kind of gives way to some disheveled nature she has. Um, but she does um, hold back somewhat. She holds her tongue is what I am trying to say. She doesn't want to appear um, ungrateful in Giovanni's presence. So she she humors the man um, and gives Leto Theophana um, a kind nod with her head and a smile. Lady Theophana, for the word lady, can be used loosely. She indeed looks very young. Uh, she just giggles, uh, uh, kind of uh, like a babbling brook just out of her throat, <laughs> and just chuckles looking you over, and, uh, and you, it threatens to laugh hysterically. She looks at you, and, and you can't help but feel a, a strong bolt of anger at this uh, girl laughing at you for no reason that you can discern. It's very rude, and this is not at all going like you thought it would. Mm, you are fraud, aren't you, my friend? Yes, you are utterly false. A black-hearted villain. I can see how you counterfeit to appear true of heart, but you do not fool me. And she steps forward to look at you and then turns to look back at Mariana. Her nose wrinkles. Oh, she's far less interesting, Giovanni. She's, well, rather plain, like barley. Barley that has just begun to rot. Oh, can't we make her rot yet? And Giovanni shakes his head. Not at all, Lady Theophana. We must anticipate what is to come. We have not yet had dinner. And it occurs to you although it hadn't occurred to you until now, Lady Julieta, that Theophana is perhaps quite mad. My lady, she kind of um, takes a step back. Um, her, her fingertips that were kind of brushing against Giovanni's arm, they immediately fall. Um, and she looks upon this woman very annoyed. Her expression is quite insulted. Um, and, and immediately after she speaks, she says, You do not know me, my lady, nor do I know you. Lady Theophana twists her neck as though pivoting of its own accord to look at you, tilting her head to one side, and there's something very eerie about the look she gives you, and despite yourself, you feel a chill go through your body as she affixes you with that gaze, and you, under, and you, you wonder why. Oh, well. Her fingers steeple together as she examines you, and, and Lord Giovanni is looking between the two of you, uh, clearly amused. I do so abhor trivial conversation at these celebrations. The hour has grown too late for talking falsely, don't you agree? Julietta just kind of stands there. She's still pretty awestruck, but she does take in the fact that this woman is very odd and there is something quite off about her and instead of responding to her she kind of turns and looks back to Giovanni and and is just trying to go with it as best as she can and kind of gives him a gentle smile and says Lord Giovanni you keep the most interesting company don't you and to your disappointment, you see that Giovanni has already turned his attention back to Mariana. He is whispering something in her ear, and she looks she looks very frightened at what he is saying to her. And yet, as you speak, uh, his attention shifts back to you. He gives you a, a faint smile. 
I have so very many, 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 many wonderful friends, and I'm happy to play host to all of them indeed, and meet new intriguing individuals such as yourself, Lady Julietta. Would you excuse me for a moment? I have a matter to discuss with the Lady Mariana about her jewels. Um, Lady Theophana, would you keep our lovely guest company for the moment? Yes, of course, Lord Giovanni. She smiles and looks back at you and you, you feel, Julietta, that this is not going well at all. Well, she's been she's been shunned at this point, um, and she can't believe it. She's never had someone turn a shoulder like that to her. Um, she's taken aback by this moment, and her eyes kind of linger on Marianna as she's being swept away. And she, there's a small part of her that sees this this young girl doesn't want to be in the company of Lord Giovanni, but she doesn't care. She doesn't feel pity for her. She she feels resentment because her plan is not going the way um, in her mind it was supposed to go. So after a moment, she kind of looks back to her lady, Theophana, but she says nothing to her. She just gives her a plain stare. And as you take your eyes off of Lady Theophana and watch as Lord Giovanni walks away with this blushing young girl in tow, a girl much more pure than you are, as was illustrated earlier, much more younger than you are, perhaps fresher. You can't help but feel that hot bolt of anger, that hot bolt of jealousy. And having taken your eyes off of Lady Theophana and, and you look back to where she perhaps had been, she is no longer there. Somehow she is circled around behind you and is clasping her hands on either side of your dress as she's tilting her head over your shoulder and watching after where you're looking at Lord Giovanni. Look at them, she says in your ear. Oh, he's chosen her, not you. I can feel how that makes you feel. Men are all the same, aren't they? <clears throat> Julietta um, is a little bit surprised by the touch of this woman her hands upon her waist and she she sort of tilts her neck somewhat um as lady theophana comes over her shoulder and speaks this and um though her eyes do linger back over to giovanni um and mariana she um only lets them rest there for a moment before kind of um lifting her chin up once more and she would attempt to walk forward and kind of brush Lady Theophana off of her. And as you do so, there is something about her grip which holds you in place, and you find that you, as you try to move forward, that her hands have begun to tighten around your shoulders, and you feel a bolt of surprise as you think that perhaps this woman was mad, and you wonder if she is going to harm you or do something unexpected, and yet that moment is broken by her next uh, words. Oh, where are you going? We've just begun to meet each other. Let me ask you something. Men. We all know what men find good and worthwhile. A bit of flesh to plug their members into. That's all that matters to them. We both know that. I was violated as a young girl, too. How old were you when you were first fucked? Julietta, um, she, she kind of stands there and her eyes kind of widen a little bit at the word, the word that she uses just so nonchalantly and in public and in front of everyone. And, and immediately she kind of turns to look at this woman. Um, and as you try to turn to look at her, she doesn't allow you to. In fact, she holds you where you're standing and presses her cheek against yours from behind and wraps her arms around you pulling your body close to hers, although you are taller than her and older than her. There's something about her that commands you as she pulls you closer and presses her lips to your ear and you feel it tickling. You see my dress? It is so torn. It was torn from a man who abducted me and took me and ravaged me and she poured his poison into me and 
draw out any purity that was in me. That is what men find good and worthwhile. What do you find good and worthwhile, Lady Julietta? Julietta, um, she just kind of stands there. She, she does not know how, what hold this woman has over her. It's, it's very transfixed and she, um, she, she parts her, her supple lips to speak, but nothing comes out. She is mesmerized and horrified all at the same time. Um, and all she can really do is is kind of just stand there. I mean, this woman just keeps talking, and it's all rather insane. And her eyes would kind of linger over to the others, um, somewhat for a distraction and somewhat um, just to kind of, even though she can't physically move away from this woman, maybe mentally move away from what's happening. Um, and as you try to distance yourself in your mind from what's happening as some way to cope with it, she moves her her head from your left cheek to your right, pressing her lips into your ear, whispering sensuously in a tone that seems to spread its tendrils insidiously into your mind. What do you mean by that? Ah, I hear what you're thinking. What about another? About survival. For what price would you compromise each one? That is what you have on your mind. I knew you were false, a black-hearted villain just like me. Survival is what matters. Love for another, perhaps. But for what price? <clears throat> Julietta kind of She's frozen, and her thoughts are, are rushing in her mind, but she does quickly say something almost automatically. She doesn't even realize she says it. And what price would you put on those things yourself, my lady? Let us talk about price. I would have an, a conversation with you about price putting that to the test. If you would come with me, you wouldn't need Lord Giovanni or the Medici or anyone. Um, trying to collect herself, she kind of lifts her chin and her, her head up once more. She's, she's trying to grasp her confidence back and she says plainly, I do believe the price I have is much too high for you. Hmm. It is not the price you have for me, but the price I have for you. I have an interest, and if you would indulge me, we might discuss price in private. Hmm? And for some reason, you don't feel as though this is a sexual come on. You've been, you've, you've been approached many times by both genders for trysts, and um, you're very intimate with uh and familiar with the um with the ways of sexual uh innuendo and and ex and you for some reason you feel that this woman is not interested in that you get the impression that she wants to she wants something behind that she wants something which you hide from the rest of your lovers and something which you've hidden away for a very long time and that frightens you um, yes, Julietta in the beginning, she, when she started speaking with Lady Theophana, she felt as though she, she wasn't quite sure what the signals were. And now that they've spoken for several minutes and she's kind of picked up on, on the, the very strange nature of this woman, she does feel as though it's not sexual at all. Um, but there is somewhat of a fear there of how of how this woman is examining her and how she speaks and her mannerisms. Um, and all of this is running through her mind at this point. But when she speaks of price, she, she isn't speaking um, literally of the price she, she has um, in terms of 
the price she gives men and her and and women for that matter but also um she's speaking more in depth now as as lady theophana is um they're they're on they're talking about another level i feel like they're both talking about something deeper and she she suddenly realizes that perhaps if she speaks to this woman it might lead to other things and that could include lord giovanni so after several seconds she would um finally sort of relax her body into lady theophana and she would say simply let us speak price then my lady good 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 <laughs> good come with me and she reaches out and grasps your hands and pulls you away and begins skipping off in the direction leaving behind in her wake that rotting flowered perfume which surrounds her like an ashen grave pulling you along out of the feast hall do you go with her as she sweeps you up in her exuberance and enthusiasm she will she follows her she does not skip though and as the camera shifts we move now to valentino who is deep in conversation with lady yadviga sipping her expensive brandy and you notice valentino that as you look around the room the hosts have begun to greet the other uh, members the other uh, members of your party and the other guests have begun to many of them have begun to leave the feast hall and leaving you relatively alone with lady yadvika of course lord giovanni is still circling the room with mariana on his arm and for a moment you can't help but feel pity for the girl as you catch a sight of her face. She looks very ashen and pale and frightened. But Lady Advika commands your attention once more as the sharp, acrid taste of that expensive brandy still lingers on your tongue as you set down the glass. Well, as we were saying, the things of leadership are very important and Hmm. Perhaps you are a man of some impression, hmm? some impressiveness, some prestige. I would consider myself a man who intends to effect his change upon the world. Yes. I saw that right away about you. You're a man with, with will, with ambition, aren't you? Yes. I do not believe my station in society is displaying of my capability. Hmm. Would you willing, be willing to show me your capability? In what way, my lady? Lady Advocate thinks for a moment before motioning to a young servant across the room. And you notice that there are, of course, other people in this room. There are the servants which serve the wine. Three men and two women. Although two men are missing, so leaving behind only... Uh, two women and one man. All of them are wearing white robes, and yet the musicians are also playing across the room. And yet there is something about the musicians. They don't seem to be paying attention to anyone inside. In fact, they just appear to be playing that same tune over and over, almost mechanically. And as she motions to the young servant, uh, the woman who a approaches her is actually a young girl in reality. Not unattractive, but not uh, clearly no one of any note of any breeding. She kneels before uh, Lady Advigas, the, the Lady Advigas commanded her to. And as the servant kneels from somewhere within the folds of her dress, the Advigas then hands you something into your hand and as you set the brandy glass down you see what she's handed you it is a a soft almost sinfully soft black leather whip which is coiled and as she hands this to you lady advica says show me you are fit to command others this servant exists only for our hmm. Only for our... the vulgarities of our existence. And must be bent to the lash to do so. To never question her place. Part of ascending to your station is to subjugate those beneath you. And as you are a man of impressive will, 
Lady Advika smiles, her fat kind of moving with the smile and the jowls of her of her cheeks. Hmm. She rises from her chair and then reaches down with her hands and almost casually rips the white robe that the woman is wearing and exposes her naked back to you. Come, Valentino. Show me what she would do with a disobedient subject. Valentino kind of stands up a little bit alarmed. Um, and he says, Surely we do not need, or at least I do not need, a whip to make this woman obedient. This is simply not in my uh, manner of business. I'm trying to find any excuse to not whip a naked woman. Not at all, Lady Advega looks at you. You are to be one of the lions and not the sheep. You must discipline those beneath you. I did not think I would have to explain that to a man of such professed potency. Lady Advega motions to the naked girl's back. You see her breasts, just hints of them, as her body shakes with a sob. You can see fear has gra- gripped her as she looks up at you, her eyes shining somewhat. She has dark hair, and she seems very young. My, oh. la- my lady, surely this is a bit vulgar of a display of power. Power is meant to be displayed. Did you not know this? I thought you were a man of breeding, a man of will, a man who was willing to ascend to a higher station. This is what it is, boy. Take that whip and show me. At this point, Valentina is a little bit intimidated. He was impressed with her aggressiveness and her domineering presence, but now he's a little bit more uh, forced into this position. So I think he's kind of feeling the only way to move forward is to acquiesce. So he reluctantly takes the whip and kind of takes a few steps back, kind of looking at this woman to see if she reacts, and looking back at uh, Lady Yagvika for to see if she's going to change her mind or tell him to stop. Lady Advika, in her heavy set demeanor and her, her long gown, which flows down to the stone floor and s- softly brushes it, circles around to where the girl kneels and she reaches down to grasp the girl by her chin and lock eyes with her. Do not move. She intones in very certain, precise words. And you see the girl go very rigid and locked as she remains kneeling. Only her sobs can be heard as Lady Yadviga withdraws and looks up at you, holding the whip there. Go on. Do what it is in the Lord's right to do. Valentino's going to make one more look around the room to see if anybody else is watching. Uh, No one seems to be watching you at all. Uh, and, and curiously, it seems as though it is just you and Lady Yadviga here, although the musicians are still playing, although the music is very muted and distant to you now. Lord Claudius Giovanni is circling the room, although he's not paying any attention to you. It is just you and this very strange, domineering woman. He kind of looks at the ground and then grasps his forehead, kind of tensed and a little bit stressed out, but then he straightens up and tries to gather his will for something he considers pretty inhuman. Uh, And then he kind of pulls the whip back hesitantly and then tries to... He tries to whip as lightly as is still considered a whip. And as you bring the stroke down, you still draw a jerk from her. From, my, from a mild sting, although you make no mark upon her back. No, 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 that will not do. Lady Advika circles around to where you are standing and grasps in her doughy hands yours, and you feel her grip on your wrists very tight as she pulls you back and shows you how to grip. It must be done so. She fixes your fingers around the whip and coils it back. Now, draw your hand back and bring it down properly. 
So he pulls his hand farther back again and jerks it forward a lot faster to try and bring down a little bit more pressure, trying to acquiesce again. Her yelp immediately splits the room as you crack open the first lash of blood across her back, and you see that scarlet drip. Again! Valentino winces, but he again whips her. Again! She begins shouting ecstatically. Again, he whips her this time a little bit harder and a little bit faster. You draw more blood, opening with each stroke on her back, a lash over and over as you see blood dripping down, and she shudders in pain. More! More! Lady Yadiga shouts. Valentino gets more into he starts whipping faster and harder, going along with the commands, getting into a rhythm. After a good 20 minutes, Finally, the servant is bleeding profusely. She is uh, completely mutilated. Her back is opened up, and Valentino is left standing there. You're perspiring yourself. Such was the effort you put in whipping her, and at Jadviga's urgings, you, you realize what you've done is she completely collapses unconscious in a miserable heap, bleeding all over the floor. Lady Advaga is looking at you with a faint grin, bright. She is not yet done. Seven more blows to show her her place. Go on. So not so much out of reluctance, but more out of fatigue. He continues again until he has whipped her seven more times. And as you bring the whip up and down seven more times, and Valentino is panting and having perpetrated this upon another human being, the camera is going to focus in on him. Describe what we're seeing. Describe what is going on with Valentino as he is, is, is doing this to this servant as he's bringing the whip down on, on, upon her motionless form, which does not twitch and no longer does she cry out, opening more wounds in her back seven more times. Valentino is kind of going through a mental evolution. I think this woman has had a very strong impression on him, almost... She came off as very exotic and very domineering, and he was at first put off, but now he is kind of taken to her as uh, being taken under her wing. He feels very much almost like he's not responsible for this because he's now just a protege, um, having been guided by her through this whole uh, ordeal. So it's easier for him to swallow this and almost it's almost become a, a thing of a new level of control over people he's never gone to because it's so brutal and visceral um, and he's been given this opportunity by being led there by Yadvika so it's it was more stressful at the beginning and he's gotten more accustomed to this this feeling of of brutal control. Valentino, make a conscience roll. Difficulty 8. You lose a point of humanity as you is you experience exactly what you described, an evolution, a mental um, awakening as you beat this servant girl mercilessly, even though she has long slipped into unconsciousness. And as Lady Yadviga watches you and the seventh and final stroke falls, she smiles approvingly and beckons to the male servant to cross the room, and as he does, you see that he is holding a, a bread tray. There's a tray with a knife and a loaf of bread.
think we lost. I... We lost you guys for a second. Are you back? I'm back. I'm here. Okay. Yep. yep. Emily, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Anybody awesome. Else? What was the last thing you heard? Uh, a, a tray with bread and a knife. Okay. And as the servant crosses the room, you see the loaf of bread that is upon the, the platter and, and the knife next to it, and Lady Yadviga picks up the knife and she slices a slice of bread and hands it to you, and then pauses before handing it fully to you, and then turns to look at the servant girl on the floor. And then Yadviga moves to kneel down and drag the bread on the floor through the blood that is pooling there, dipping it in there soaking it through and she rises with the dark yeasty bread dripping blood and hands it to you Valentino taste a commander of men must not fear the spilling of blood Valentino takes it kind of as uh, seeing it as some kind of completion to some kind of animalistic or savage right he feels very much more like a creature than a man right now and he's very much in the moment uh, appreciating the gravity of it so he's taking it takes a very um, decisive bite of it and as you bite into that yeasty bread which tastes so sharply of wheat and barley and yet you feel the slimy tang of that blood the acrid coppery taste and you, as you chew, Yadviga is looking at you. This world is a veil of tears, Valentino. In the veil of tears, one must flog or be flogged. Make a conscience roll as you chew. Difficulty eight. And as you chew, you think perhaps that Yadviga is showing you something, and yet reality hits you as you realize what you're doing, as you chew the blood and the, the salty, sweet tang of the girl's blood, coppery in your mouth, suddenly causes your gag reflex to threaten to rise up. Make a stamina roll, difficulty seven. You manage to stop yourself from vomiting the bread back up, but describe what we're seeing as Valentino struggles with this. So Valentino is kind of at that borderline between still being a human, still and becoming something else, and he has this kind of flash. He thinks back to just maybe 20 or 30 minutes ago. He was holding Saga's hand, leading her to a feast, and now he's he's chewing on bread soaked in the blood of a woman he just flogged nearly to death if not to death and it's kind of all hitting him all at once and the coppery taste of the blood is not as as surreal it's now a lot more distasteful and he's he's, un he's unsure of himself of what he is and as you gag on the bread Lady Yadviga immediately closes the distance between you in two swift steps and she reaches up to grip your lower jaw and grasp your face and you feel her nails digging into your cheeks swallow as she locks her eyes with you and without even consciously doing it you feel your throat working as you swallow the bread and you are left with the crumbs and the taste of blood in your mouth as she looks at you do I see compassion there? in your eyes. Valentino kind of stares back. He can he can feel a little bit of like tears starting to form. A combination of like fear and self-loathing and uncertainty. Lady Advaga's doughy face screws up into a look of disappointment as she pushes your face away with her hand. And for a moment, you are filled with shame 
and guilt and horror at what you'd done. And as you find yourself looking at the girl on the floor, you can't help but wonder. And then suddenly her hand strikes you full across the face. You were hit without even seeing what had happened, and yet Lady Yadviga had done so. She had hit you full in the face like a man, and as you spin around and crash to the floor, she yells at you, yells loud enough for the banquet hall to reverberate with her voice. Compassion is a weakness, boy, that must be beaten out of you. Stay there. And as you look up at her eyes and you're locked in position, what is Valentino doing as she, he is assaulted by this woman who now has the whip in her hand? Valentino is kind of leaning back, holding a hand up, cowering a little bit. He's he's lost his fearsome brutality and now he's reverted to more animalistic fear of what's going to happen next. You see something animal in Lady Yadvika's eyes, something bright and hungry and feral, something excited as she looms over you, that doughy pale woman with that whip in her hand, and she raises the whip high. You are not one of the lions after all, but one of the sheep, and she brings the whip down and it cracks across your face, drawing blood, and you feel the sting. Valentino winces and cries out, he tries to put his hands back up, not able to come up with any words, just hoping that she will stop. And as the camera pulls away and fades out a bit, that is what we see as we close, as we move out. We see Yadviga towering over Valentino and whipping him mercilessly next to the body of this servant over and over again just as she showed him. And with that, guys, we are nearing the two-hour mark, so I'm not going to start a new scene. Uh, we're going to take our ten-minute break, and then we're going to get back into it. Holy shit! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my gosh! gosh. <laughs> that was intense. Yep. <laughs> I was like, oh, she's kind of like the Pillsbury Doughboy, you know? You know, if I get back in time and I see what happened, I'm going to... Don't worry, I'm going to be the one protecting you, just like you promised to protect me. <laughs> obviously, you're not doing a good job, and somebody else do it, so I'm going to have to come back and protect you, I'm guessing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, man. That was, a, that was a tense scene. That was tense. He's not going to be very good looking when we come back to dinner. <laughs> yeah. So much yeah. for my appearance thoughts. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, there, there's more than one reason I wouldn't want to BDSM with Valentino anymore. <clears throat> uh, I mean, he's Valentino. tainted now. He's tainted now. The goods are damaged. The goods are damaged. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. in more than one sense of the word. I mean, his humanity is down, too. He, he had a pang of conscience. Yeah. <laughs> Probably made that a lot more painful than it had to be. Probably. He can always get his conscience back, though, in the future. Well, I've kept my <laughs> conscience. I think I lost my humanity. Oh. Yeah. Well, he can get his humanity, hopefully. Maybe. Uh, if he wants well, he, to. He, he, he did lose... Uh, point of humanity and I don't know if I should even announce that anymore humanity shifts uh, it kind of leaves you guys in the dark to, as to what's going on with every character I think that would be more interesting but right. since I, I did announce it you know he did lose a point of humanity but um, I was having make I was having him make you know conscience rolls yeah and I mean I'm not criticizing the way you did it I think you did it really well it was a really interesting thing to watch I was just you know that's not why I was writing you know, a different way of doing it. It's just, I don't right. usually think of other ways of doing it, but this time I did, so I was kind of like, holy fuck, I thought of this other way to do it. So. It wasn't, it wasn't my intention to, like, criticize anybody. Oh, no, of course not. Um, is everyone enjoying uh, 
enjoying their their scene so far? <laughs> oh yeah, very much. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering I what the know. fuck's happening, because the dude that's, like, leading us off to this fucked up freeway, he is not, like, he does not strike me as somebody who is a gangrel, so I do not know what this is, where this is going. Um, after that scene with, uh, Valentino, I'm a little, I'm a little worried going into a room with, with much more dangerous things than a whip. <laughs> 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 But we'll see. Yeah. Well, I like. I'm just saying. Like, I don't think this is this is my sire. So I'm just kind of like wondering how to get the fuck out of this situation because I think I have a a shot at doing it. And uh, if Saga gets cornered, Saga gets mad. If Saga gets mad. Saga smash. Really? Yeah. Well, there's one can. more host. There's one more host that we haven't seen yet. Mm. That woman. Sure. The woman in the britches. Yeah. That's right. Everyone kind of lost track of Lady Demetra. Where did she go? I don't know. Well, it's just, you know, because um, you know the thing I told you about? Um, the, the first, um, the first uh, miscarriage? Um, because of that, she's become a lot more defensive when she gets cornered. So that's why I was making that mm-hmm. remark. Yeah. Well, I'm with a crazy lady right now, so... <laughs> yeah! I'm yeah, with, like, some insane lady. She looks fun. Yeah. yeah. What are you guys gonna do? Gonna knit, like, um, straight jackets together? <laughs> yeah. Definitely. <laughs> well, the only reason why she went with her was because she's like, well, if I can't have Lord... You cut so. out. Everything cut out for me for a second there. <laughs> but I know why you went off for her anyway, so it doesn't, you know. Yeah, yeah, I told you. Yeah. <sighs> no, but, like, I kind of want to do what I told you I might do, Sam. I kind of want to do that. Because that'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, worst case, I mean, feel free to implement the same strategy. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. I mean, it's always, like, literally, there's nothing you can lose more than what you're gonna lose. Like, in that situation, you're probably gonna feel like you're gonna die anyways, so... In that situation, there's literally nothing else you could lose at that point. Mm-hmm. So just, just do it. Chomp away. <laughs> I, I'm already, like, seeing everybody falling into their clans and their clan patterns. Yeah. Where did Garmin go again? Did he go down to the dungeons? Yep. Yeah. He's gonna go, uh... Russell yeah, you're gonna go with out. Big Dude. You're gonna go with Big Dude. That's interesting. Yep. Big Dude. Yeah. Yeah, Big Dude. Uh, call Drogo point two. <laughs> gonna go eat some Have hearts. Yeah. Be careful where. <laughs> be, be, be careful where you place your butt. <laughs> Why does my mind always go there? I don't know. I feel bad for Mariana, too. I'm like, she's not interesting. Talk to me. <laughs> and he was just like, well, um... Well, I mean, you almost saved her from, like, certain rape. And now she's gonna get raped because you didn't... Yeah, I know, I know. So it would have been nicer if you did. <laughs> I know, I feel... You know, there was a little part of her was like, maybe I should save this girl. But then when it didn't even work, she was like, no, fuck this girl. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, you know, like, as I as I talked to you about, like, I don't see a reason for Julietta not to do the things she usually does, as long as it doesn't get inconvenient for her. And at yeah. that point, it was getting inconvenient for her, so that made, to- made total sense to what you and I talked about. Yeah, because she was like, no. <laughs> like, this is getting too much effort. I am leaving. Yeah. I, I just don't, I just don't get why we're being 
escorted away by this by one guy and what like is he trying to like nab a bigger portion of the food than everybody else like what what is he hoping to accomplish like have they like hid hid like the guy the like the gangrel guy because he looks too much like an animal or a woman because they look too much like an animal somewhere and like like a room in the castle because they couldn't yeah maybe he's person. escorting you he's escorting you to your uh you're, uh, yeah, you're... like, because they look too much <laughs> like a fucking bear or something. <laughs> <laughs> they can't be around normal people. <laughs> like, I'm gonna get tossed into the Rancor pit. <laughs> no, I guarantee you it's probably the one the one uh, host that we haven't, that hasn't really been introduced yet. We just kind of, like, he, like, Giovanni introduced her and then she vanished. I guarantee you right. it's her. Yeah, probably, but it's like, what is she going to do, intercept this? Because it does seem like this guy is, you know, trying to get a bigger portion of the meal than he's entitled to. I don't know. I, it, honestly, oh. expect anything. This game, this game can get scary. <laughs> well, I'm more like, I'm going to put, I'm going to push, I'm sorry, dude, but I'm going to push you, like, in his way if he gets too close to me, and then I'm going to, then I'm going to take off. Who, Diego? Yeah, like I'm not, like I'm not, you know, taking it. I'm pushing. I'm Diego's pushing gonna take away. the brunt. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Diego. you're the man here. It's it's, it's medieval <laughs> times. You take it. <laughs> I'm I'm the, I'm the fairer sex. I can't handle this shit. Oh man, that's funny. You be you be you be my meat shield. <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst kind of way to describe this situation. <laughs> Man, I, I came it, back I mean, at a weird true, time. It's, well, it's true, though. Like, like I'm sorry, Diego, but, you know, this guy's going after me. You're going to have to take the brunt. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just push him and run. I feel like Diego would probably do something if it was, like, really, like, whoa. Because it doesn't, like, in the, when we were at the uh, inn, it seemed like, Scott's character, like, when, when those characters are being all creepy with all the ladies, yeah. his character was just, like, really disgusted by it and was like, what the hell? And... Yeah, of course. I'm just saying, like, if it doesn't happen, I'm going to push him in the way. <laughs> we'll I'm have to see. <laughs> like, I'm prepping for um, a Call of Cthulhu game on Wednesday, and I'm, like, totally in the same kind of mindset with that, just... You know, if I need to push somebody in the way in front of a monster, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> like, nobody, yeah. like, even if you're a hero, like, you're still gonna be dead. And, you know, what what use do you have of that hero status then? Alright, guys, so, uh, I think our break's about over. Is everybody ready to get back into it? Yep. Yeah. Is Scott here? Scott? Buddy? Did you get scared? Meat shield? <laughs> <laughs> Scott? I don't know if he's muted or not. Sometimes he has problems with his microphone. Oh. Well, can you write something, Scott, if you can hear us? At least? Maybe he went to... went somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, I think he he's probably AFK. But he didn't write anything. Yeah, he's probably gone for a minute. <sighs> oh, this is a fuck fest. I couldn't believe she was like, you're a phony. You're a fake. <laughs> I, I knew she was going to say that. I could see like... right through you. My character was like, whoa, bitch. <laughs> but... I, I, knew, I knew that was whoa. happening. Maltavians always do that. Like, my character was like, bitch, like, pick the fuck up. No, I'm just kidding. But that's how she was feeling. She was like. She whips out the Z snap. This bitch. bitch nah. You don't bitch. know me. You don't know me, bitch. She's like calling me out of my shit. And I'm like, whoa. Well, that's what they do, though. That's always what the Malks do. That's always what happens. Like, when I was playing a Malkavian, like, the guy was like, well, you're a fucking murderer sadist. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And it was like, stab this woman with a needle, and I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. It don't work out. It, don't work out. <laughs> it was fine. 
<sighs> but, like, that's the point, though, you know? They're insane, and they see through everything, but they can't really tell anybody about it, because nobody believes them. Well, I feel like, you know, back in the day, some, va- like, some higher leveled vampires might have, like, had Malkavians by their side because they, like, thought that they could see the future or tell them things, you know? Probably. But only if you really, you know, had that, like, had that power, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, for example, like, even in the computer game, when you walk around, if you listen to the whispers when you're sneaking around as an Malkavian, you can hear the whispers, like, basically spoiling the game if you know how the game ends. They're they're saying things that are telling you how the game ends. Yeah. Just know how to interpret the whispers. So are are you back yet, Scott, or? Scoot! Scott? I think, uh, I don't know. Scott's either AFK or he's having trouble with his uh, mic. (laughs) What if he can't hear us? Oh, I'm sure you can. Well, it's worth a try. <sighs> Yo, girl, you need some allergy pills. I know. Oh. Right. Yeah, I hate that. It feels like you like swall like you swallowed a cardigan or something, and it's kind of sore and shit. I don't like it. Yeah. <clears throat> let's, let's try to uh, refresh the call, guys. See if we can okay. get Scott back in there. Right. Hello, hello. Hey. Hello. Scott, are you back? I'm here. Oh, there he is. Okay, finally. God. Did, could, could, could you could you hear us talking, Scott? Oh, I was actually in the bathroom. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Oh, we yeah. were like calling for you for like. Minutes. Oh, like, really? Really? <laughs> there he is. Oh, okay. Alright, cool. So let's let's get back into it, guys. Right. <laughs> um Alright, we're gonna open with our next scene. Ready, yeah. We open with our next scene with Garman leading the way as Lothar, well actually Lothar is leading the way, uh, three men walking down a flight of stairs, stone stairs, down into the shadows of what appears to be an old wine cellar. First we see Lothar emerge holding a torch, we see his face scarred as it is from forehead to jaw, and then we see Garman follow after him emerging into the dark wine cellar. What is Yerman doing as he leaves the flight of stairs and emerges into this dark room? Uh, Yerman is uh, focused on the task at hand. Uh, he's wondering about his, his guest. Um, not, it's not often that when he does this, people actually volunteer to witness it. Um, so he is thinking about that, but his, his mind is very focused on, this, on the, the task at hand. Following after you is Marquettis. His voice had been carrying down the stairs as we see these three men, and we hear him as he emerges with uh, both Lothar and Garman into the wine cellar below. Tell me, Garman, how do you believe your enemies should be treated? Um, Garman is, um, is this just as they're walking down? Yeah, this is as they're emerging into the cellar. Um, as Garman um, hears this man's massive, powerful voice kind of echo throughout the corridors. All of my enemies are the Lord's enemies, and they must be struck down swift and just. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Mercy's a trick that great men invented to keep the weak from interfering. No truly great man is merciful. Enemies must be crushed. Potential enemies must be kept wounded and weak, don't you agree? Crusader. In the end, every plan relies on a strong arm and tempered seal. That's right. And as Lothar 
remains silent as he leads the way, allowing you and Marquettis to speak as the torchlight illuminates the uh, wine cellar. It is a dank, cold room. And as the light illuminates this room from the torchlight that Lothar is holding, you see a naked man is chained up against the wall. His body is covered with new wounds. And you see torture devices, torture devices surround him. Here you are, Inquisitor. This is my man that was primarily involved in taking of the monk. I leave him at your tenderness. It's Lothar bows towards you, and he actually puts the uh, torch in a sconce nearby before turning to leave. Marquetta folds his arms across his chest. <laughs> Great men need to be feared. As he looks over the man. Uh, what is Yerman doing as you see your prisoner before you? Um, he, he wastes no time. He immediately is walking over to the other side of the room where there's a, a mass table. Um, he's, he begins unhooking and unlatching his sword. And he sets it down with with, uh, with almost great care. And then he um, is, is walking towards the back of the room. And he... What, what, what kind of uh, devices in, are in here? Do, do I recognize? Uh, you, you see an array of hooks and pinchers and tools used for pulling, proking, uh, pulling, poking, and prodding all across the nearby table. There's also a Judas cradle here, and uh, the uh, implements that you see on the, on the wall that the chains are actually drawn on, the man is chained to the wall, you see that there is also a crank which could stretch his arms in a rack-like fashion as well. Um, and as you look around uh, and examine the, the tools at your disposal, the man, he, he, he looks up, he, he hangs his head weakly up. Looks like he's already been worked over somewhat before you are coming down here. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not with these men. They're demons. They're, they're, they're not living men. Um, Garman pays no mind to this man. He, he begins fastening his, um, the man's, uh, wrists and his, his ankles, making sure they're, they're securely fastened. Please! They took me from my village! I, I have no truck with this, with this, with this, this these demons! As, um, Garman's gonna continue being, um, focused on making sure that the rack is fully uh, set and when it is, he's going to draw his, his, his small dagger and he's going to point it at the man you are accused of murder you confess I, I, I haven't killed anyone I, I, I don't I, I've been down here for days I where, where's the sun these men, they, they, they took me and... Who, who are you? I am German de Gascoigne, an inquisitor of the Holy Mother Church. Please, please give me confession. I, I, I've not been allowed to see a priest. He's a mouthy one, isn't he? Marquetta says, from uh, standing off to the side behind you. They always are. But never the words you need to speak. And he, be, he he walks over to the crank, and he cranks it one notch down. And as you pull the crank downward, you hear the, the rattle of the chains and then the pulling. As his arms are suddenly jerked upward, very tight, you see his joints stretch. Not quite yet enough to cause pain, but to get his attention. No! No, please! I, please! You, you, you ate demons! They're not men. I've seen things. Seen what things? Such things in this place. Please. Don't. Please. I, let me go and I, I, I will tell you. Always to be let go. You must confess between yourself and God. That's I think the only you need another prank. 
he holds up his, his hand for a moment um, to silence our guests as he walks closer to the man with a knife, with his knife in his hand. Confess now, and your pain will end. I get this. I see evil, my, my lord. I these men. And as he as he begins talking, he immediately walks over to the crank and pulls it down another notch. And immediately, as the chains pull, you hear the taut, sinewy groan of his elbows. You see them pulled at their very joints, and his shoulders stretched to their absolute limit. These are very unforgiving increments. Rack as his ankles are suddenly stretched tight as he's pulled upward. He actually rises a couple inches up the wall, and a shriek of pain fills the room. <laughs> My father! <laughs> Garman um, walks back and forth between the man, and, and he now pulls down his hood. Um, revealing his his dark and uh, very muttered gray hair and he kind of runs his gauntleted hand over his hair you are confessed you are convicted of murder do you not remember your brother our brother Clement how you beat and kick him until he was beaten and broken no you murdered him no. confess I didn't kill anyone please let me go my arms, they hurt so. <laughs> As, and then he's just gonna take a moment, like looking at the man, and then he's gonna walk over with his knife, and very softly he's gonna start dragging it across the man's elbows, where his skin is very taut. Do you know what happens when you cut the flesh of a man when his skin is so taut? Please. It pulls, it almost rips quite far up the arm. It's <laughs> Quite painful. I, I, I'm just a man from the village. I do not. I do not. I'm, I'm a shoemaker. Please. Why do you claim innocence when I have seen your work? Go ahead and make a perception. No, make a wits investigation roll. Uh, difficulty seven. All right, I'll relay the results of that. No, we, we paused for a moment. Uh, yeah, I was, I was relaying the results of his role. Why do you pause, Gehrman? Go on, give him another crank. Or maybe start in with those tools over there, Marquetta says with uh, a faint smirk that you see in the dim firelight. Um, the man's words kind of echo in, in Garman's head as he as he stops to consider um, the and the weeping sounds of the man he's torturing uh, before him. He walks over to the to the table and, and views the the accoutrement of tools. And then he walks, he's going to walk slowly back towards the man and grab him by the jaw and kind of look at his face. You are convicted of murder, sir. Please, I, I didn't kill 
my god. Let me go. If you are not the man we are looking for, if you are not our murderer, then you are accusing our host, Lord Giovanni. Is this so? He is a demon! I've seen him face. I've seen such things, my lord. I am saying. I can't even make sense of what he's saying now, Marquetta says from behind you. And then he's gonna go back to the to the bucket, um, where there's like a very dank and drizzled, uh, dirty water. Um, he's gonna take it and he's gonna splash it on the man. <laughs> and you see the water by the light kind of glimmer a bit as it runs down his face, turning crimson with rivulets of blood from the wounds that are faint in his cheekbones as though he's been hit in the face repeatedly and his his head hangs down, damp hair ragged kind of locks hanging over his his eyes as his arms stretch and he, he tries to move his body upward as though to get more comfortable but he can't get more leverage as his heels scrape against the stone wall <gasps> Now speak Speak of these things you have seen there is nothing truer than the words under this sort of pain. I have seen it. I... Lord, G Lord Giovanni is a demon. He's not a man. He, none of them are men. Please. I've seen... I've seen the dead walk. I've seen their bodies. I've seen blood. They take it. They've tr drank my blood. That doesn't make any sense, Marquetta says. Not men. I have seen them. They are clearly of, of men. No. No, they're not, my lord. <laughs> and then he's going to look back at the host. You see? The front line of this war is not in this dungeon, as he motions to the room. And then he's going to grab and palm the man's head and hold it up, but rather inside the mind. <gasps> Go ahead and make a perception empathy roll. And then he just lets the man's head hang. Please. Please loosen these chains. He kind of steps back and is wiping his hands with the cloth. Do you know if they brought the second man in? Second man? There was, there was two men. Hmm. Why not focus on this one first? Marquetta says. You haven't even touched any of these tools. Uh, the tools call out when the work is needed. As he goes back and kind of throws the, the cloth on the table. I need another prisoner. <laughs> I did not think the Inquisition gave up after only five minutes. It's not giving up, sir. We are not releasing him. Hmm. Well, I suppose. Tell me something, Garman. Do you find enjoyment working for the church? Do you find fulfillment working for these, these Christians? Christians? he moves to the man. You speak oh. the word as if you are not. Hold on, Emily dropped for a second. Welcome back, Emily. 
Hello? I didn't realize I went anywhere. Whoa, you sound really far away now. How about now? Much better. Okay, go ahead and repeat your your uh, your line, Dana. Christians, you speak of the word as if you are not. You see Marquettes' painted face twist into a scowl. We're not talking about me here, German. We're talking about you. Don't you detest the elitist swine that make up the Catholic, this Roman church? To their nailed god. Don't you think kings and popes need to be fed the oars on the steps of the Roman Republic? Ugh. You disgust me in a lot of ways. But in a lot of ways, I know you're a man. A man of combat and action. They're using you, Garman. Can't you see that? Garman is going to take a long, hard look at this man. And it's, it's horribly blasphemous, what he's saying. Yeah. Um, and then he's, he's, he's going to be gripping his sword in hand. And imagine what I'd get from you if you were on my table, sir. With your <laughs> heresy. <laughs> I don't worship your nailed god. I worship Tingri. Names long lost. But I'll tell you what. He wipes his mouth. If you think you got it in you, come at me, Inquisitor. Um, Garmin's gonna immediately start scanning the room. How big is this room? Uh, it's it's like a, it's I mean it's a small cold chamber. There's not a lot of room to move around in here, but there's also not a lot in here either. There's not a lot of. Uh, obstacles. I mean, there's the, the table and the torture instruments behind you. There's a few uh, racks of wine on the wall, but other than that, it's a fairly bare room. It's about, uh, I would say, 10 by 15 feet across. Okay. Okay. Um, Gammon's going to set his dagger on the table and then quickly unsheathe his greatsword and throw the scabbard across the room as he as he begins to move to the side with the blade out, almost as if like circling in a battle stance. Marquetta circles around with you, squaring off with you, looking at you in the flickering firelight with his fearsome bearded face and his narrow dark eyes. Look at you, a tool of gaudy elitist trash. You think you can take me, Crusader? Hmm? You don't know who you're looking at. And he doesn't... He's not even listening to this man at this point. At this point, you, he can hear small whispers under under Garman's breath. Gloria patri et fili et spiritu sancti, secutur et purpuri, et nuet et semper, et in simpure, sacrururum. Amen. And he grips the sword with both his hands and he charges and he's going to take a swing at this man's torso. Alright. Go ahead and make that attack roll. You roll uh, that ten. 10 again. Okay. All right. And as you uh, as you swing, go ahead and uh, you, you 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 actually connect. So go ahead and roll that damage. And that 10 counts for 2, yeah? Uh, no. You don't have your 4th dot of melee yet. I d oh, yeah. That's correct. Okay. That Not that any of you guys heard that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And as the sword makes contact with his flesh, go ahead and describe where you struck. Um, the sword cleaves um, the man straight in the middle and comes across his belly. And as the sword slices across his battered leather armor, you see it cuts cleanly through the armor. And yet, Marquettis isn't moved at all by the blow. In fact, he allowed you to strike him. You see that. And he merely smiles at you beneath his beard. You're going to have to try harder than that, churchman. Go ahead and roll initiative. you do uh you see your swing has done almost nothing to this man it's scratched his armor um garman recoils as as he's uh, insulted and he's baring his teeth and he's furrowed his brow and he's and he readies himself for another swing as he brings his great sword above and comes barreling down on top of the man as a in a downward swing As you swing at Marquettis, he, he almost easily steps out of the way. And moving faster than, than you can even realize, he, before you know it, his hand has reached down and gripped the blade of your sword as he just stepped out of the way and grabbed it mid-swing. And he pushes his bearded face into yours in the flickering firelight. And for the first time, you see the feral look in his eyes, something inhuman and animal as he bears his teeth at you, and you see the hint of fangs. You. You are a tool of false-hearted fops, you clot pole. You swing at what you don't understand, and then he throws you as he pushes your sword away and with such force that you are flown back across the room. Um... As Garman flies through the air and crashes up against the stone wall and then falls to the ground in very heavy armor, um, he, he quickly tries to stumble to his feet, being restricted by this armor as he's gasping and panting. You un your holy, unholy demon! <laughs> my strength is Tengri in my bones and the earth. I fought and killed Christians long before you were ever a boy. Swing at me again if you can, churchman, up on your feet. As he pants and gasps, he grips his sword as tightly as he can, and he rushes forward with a with a cry and swings wide to to cut the man in half. <laughs> moving like 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 fluid in motion you've never fought someone like this as you swing at him he easily sidesteps out of your swing and then moving like a blur his arm snaps up and suddenly he something heavy and ferociously powerful smashes into your jaw as he makes an attack Nice. <laughs> 
one second. Doing some quick math. Broken damage, which is why he got to reroll that 10. Alright, you take three bashing as as his, like I said, he moved faster than you could see and his fist swings up and just smashes into your jaw and sends you flying back across the room again. Go ahead and make a dexterity melee roll to hold on to your weapon as you're sent sprawling. You barely managed to hold on to your sword. What happens, Gearman? Um, he, he's thrown forward, or thrown backwards as the fist comes and just hits him in the face. Um, he's he's struggling to try and keep his balance with his sword and his armor. It's, it's, it's quite top-heavy, so he's trying to stay on his feet, but he, he's slipping and sliding along the stone as he's kind of kneeled down. Um, he gets back up and spits blood from his, from his mouth, and as it's trickling down his face, he rushes forward and tries to impale the man. And you hear Marquetta shout, Impressive! Alright. All right, you you hit him. Okay. With one success. Yep, with one success. So. You roll that ten again. Oh, he takes he uh, he takes two levels of lethal. What do you do to him? As he runs forward and shoves the sword into him, um, it goes about halfway, and for this sword, that's quite far. And he's he's pushing and trying to twist, and he's he's burying his face at him, and like with his teeth bared, and he's spit is coming down, and he's he's very just growling in this guy's face as he just starts to scream. Marquetta's tried to dodge out of the way, but the blow hit and it landed and it stuck up it deep into his side and you scrape his ribs. It's a blow that would have killed any man. And yet he is still standing. He's looking down at you, looking down at the wound. <coughs> Not bad. He reaches down and he grabs the blade of your sword as he forcibly pulls it from the wound. And you see, before your very eyes, the hole you had opened up in his chest, in his side, close. It completely vanishes as he grips your blade. That is the last thing you see before his fist comes swinging around once more. Um, as he's pulling the sword from his body, Garman is is forcibly trying to push back so that he can't, but to no, abo to no abide, it doesn't move, and he's awestruck as the, the hole just closes up and he doesn't even see this fist coming from the side as it hits him. Go ahead and roll your soak. You can roll your stamina. He hits you in the head, so no armor.
you take five more levels of bashing as white explodes in your vision and stars as you feel as though you were hit from the hammer of God itself as it crashes into the side of your temple and you are spun around collapsing, crashing to the ground as you feel pain and agonizing pain a pain that raced down your spine when he hits you. Garman, what happens? Um, as he's as his vision just, just blacks out for a second um he kind of catches too um, on the ground as he's as as now he's only on the ground crawling, um, but can barely move because of the weight of his armor. Um, he just feels pain, just immense amount of pain racking his whole head and his body as it shoots down his spine. He tries to like roll over and look at the man as he's using his elbows to try and push himself backwards on the floor. It's been a long time since a man took three hits from me. I'm impressed. You hear Marquettis' voice vaguely in the distance, but your ears are pounding as though blood is something that's knocked loose in your head as blood just rushes out of your nose and as you're crawling, you're trying to, fighting to stay conscious. Any lesser man would have been unconscious by now, but you just managed to hold on to that flickering light and you feel his iron strong fingers twist in your hair and jerk your head up before pushing your head and the stone floor rushes up at you and you only see blackness so we switch scene as we go as the camera shifts to a different part of Lord Giovanni's mansion We open our next scene seeing Saga Diego in arm in arm with Sire Winchestas, the curious looking man who is very adorned in his jewelry and his silks and he's going on and on about himself and all the art that he's seen over the years and all the many things and and speaking of talking of Diego, of course, to Saga. And did you know, Saga, that he is an architect, such an educated and talented man? Well, we find ourselves in wondrous company for such an artiste is amongst us, and myself, of course, as he looks to you, Saga, as the three of you are climbing a spiral staircase heading somewhere. Yeah, she's uh, she's kind of looking behind her, kind of like, like I don't want to be here. <laughs> she's not really paying. Cool. She's not really paying attention. Diego just seems giddy with the praise. He doesn't even say anything, following along almost like a willing dog. He's never had anyone in recent years give him so much. I would like to know your talent, Diego, and young lady. Wouldn't you also like to know his talent? Wouldn't you like to see what this Spaniard can create? And as he says this, Saya Vincheslis' fingers lace in with your gown, Saga, and pulls you almost sensuously close to him. And for a moment, you almost falter in your steps. Be careful now, we're walking. I'm walking in the staircase. <laughs> well, don't you worry, little saga. Sire Vincheslis has a hold on you, and he presses his hand up against your buttocks and pushes you up the stairs as though to guide you. Yeah, she uh, swears a little bit silently in Swedish, and she hurries her pace to actually try to get a little bit of a distance between them. Oh, I do so love it when they run, don't you, Diego? And he looks over at you as Saga ascends the stairs quicker than the two of you, and come now. And you emerge at the top of the staircase into a sumptuous boudoir, a room which could only be described as the height of opulence during this time. There is a four-poster bed and silks and satin sheets and curtains hanging over the crenellations of the wall, the arrow slits 
of the fortified manor house. And we see an easel with things of art and instruments of painting, and we see bits of chalk and charcoal, and many drawings hung on the walls, and many works of art. These are my chambers, aren't they lovely? Vincesla says as he enters the room and closes the door behind him. The camera shifts to Diego as they emerge, and then to Saga. I cannot disagree, senor. This is marvelous. Saga stays close to the door, and she keeps her back against the wall. But of course, beauty must come in the most natural of forms. We must be free to divest ourselves of any mm, pretense. You are among artists, and I am your sire. So, why don't you divest yourselves of those horribly restricting clothes? Diego, let us see your fine sculpted Spaniard chest, and you, Lady Saga, may we see those fair, pubescent budding breasts, hmm? Senor, this is a most unusual request. Oh, not at all, not at all. We just need to be more comfortable amidst each other, and I would watch you paint, Diego. No, no, I would have you sketch. See a glorious cathedral as though you are building it for God yourself in your mind. Go, there is some chalk, but first, remove your shirt. Let us see your body. Is he watching him? Yes, Vincesla is I'm, looking I'm, at I'm going to try to grab for the door. I'm going to try to, like, very, like... Still standing in the same place, kind of reach for the door, try to open it. As Vincheslis uh, is currently looking at Diego, but not too far inside the room, as you suddenly make a motion. One moment. Uh, for an for an old for an old man pushing his sixties, he's enormously alert. And as the minute you go to grab the uh, the iron ring of the door to his bedchambers, he he reaches down and and grasps your wrist with his paper thin skin and his weathered wrinkled hands. And he he lifts up your wrist and he turns you around in a pirouette as though you were dancing together. And he pulls you close as when Chesless looks down at you, his white beard tickling your face and smiling, a crinkly-eyed smile at you. Where are you going, young lady? You wouldn't leave Sire Chesless, would you? Mm-mm. Naughty, naughty. Oh, my lord, I am afraid that I feel quite lightheaded from the drinks we were served. I do not drink often. Oh, I, I think uh... perhaps that lightheadedness you feel is... Fashion. Yes, you are just pubescent in the early flowering of your youth. Certainly, down between your legs, there is a certain warmth, the heat, perhaps? Hmm? Perhaps after looking at Diego. And when Chesless turns to look at Diego, and he reaches up with his papery, wrinkled hand, and he grasps your chin, and he turns your chin to look at Diego. See? Have you not seen in the yard what the stallion does to the mare, young lady? Oh, you do not know of these things yet. And he pushes his finger to your lips to stop any forthcoming reply. Just divest yourself of this. Let Sire Vincesless help you. And he reaches up his hands and he begins pulling at the shoulders of your dress. What is Diego doing? I'm going to bite him. I'm going to bite him. Okay. No. Senor, I will make you the most amazing sketch this, I promise you. But why not let the poor woman go? It's clear she does not enjoy our company. Okay, where are you biting him? In the fingers, because that's what he has by my lips. Uh, he doesn't seem to... Uh, as you bite down on his finger, it doesn't yield to your teeth the way you expected it to. His hands look very frail and, and old and, and wrinkly, and, and, and yet something stops your teeth as you hit bone. It's like, it's just, it doesn't keep going and there's something cool and, and hard about his hands as as he yanks quickly his fingers out of your mouth and, and he goes ah! No, no, no! And he pats your cheek in a sharp little slap as though to reprimand you. Although not too hard. 
Ah, you. I see you need incentive, young lady. Perhaps some pocket money for back home? Hmm? Sire Venceslas has gold and jewels aplenty to adorn this fair, lovely skin. Diego, why are you not out of your tunic yet? Diego gulps deep. The, it is true that the sound of all this money did invoke his greed a bit. I have money aplenty for both of you. Vincesis. My lord, I am a rich and powerful lady, and I am no need of your money. I am a widow, and I know which, what you speak of. mid and I am he not going to take part of face, this. Saga, and he looks into your face, and you feel something come over you as he looks at you. You feel overwhelmed as though some force has come over your head. And he is suddenly the most fascinating man you have ever seen. One moment. You, you are struck by the sight of him. Your heart flutters as Sire Vincestlis looks at you and you see him in a way that you had never seen him before. You see your father, you see your grandfather, you see figures of authority and you yield to him. Suddenly, your sentence cut off. There we are. Don't you be a good girl. You come along and obey, won't you? Yes, you will. I think you will. Go on. And you find yourself helpless to resist as his fingers reach up and begin tugging away at your dress, pulling them down, exposing the bare milk white of your shoulder. Diego, you see her suddenly transfixed by Venceslas as he begins pulling away at her dress. Senor, he says cautioningly, whatever you think is going to happen here, I won't be part of it. Not even for gold? And jewels? You needed a patron, didn't you, Diego? Come, see her pubescent body, so hairless, so aesthetically pleasing. And how is Saga reacting to this sudden power overcoming her? You're only faintly aware of your clothes being removed. Well, he's just kind of paralyzed. There is an extenuating circumstance, I'm afraid, Senor. Is there? I am not fond of women. Oh, that's no trifle at all. Perhaps we might turn her about, and then when Chesless spins her about and lifts up her dress, showing her backside. Just pretend she's a boy. Diego's ah. it's quite funny. But, and he drops her dress, leaving Saga standing there dazed, transfixed by this power that has come over her. And Vincestlis approach you, he swiftly moves across the room. Diego, don't you see? And he clasps your face in his hands. Show me what you can do. You could be great. I could make you great. And he pulls you close. Would you like that? I could be your patron. It would fulfill my fantasy, senor. Indeed. But the woman, she's in the way, and his eyes will drift over to Saga. What is Saga doing as she's left there with her dress hanging off her shoulders? Is there any way I can um, try to, like, snap out of it? Uh, you are transfixed currently by Venceslas, although you still have your mind. You just find him unbelievably fascinating and, and unbelievably uh, desirable. Right. Uh, well, you know, he still, like, said that I wasn't wanted here, so I think she, you know, try to fix their dress at that point. Okay, and, and so she tries to pull the shoulders up again? Yep. And as Saga tries to pull her dress upwards, then Chesless turns around and looks at you. No, no, no. You are good just like you are, young lady. Push that back down, and the power of his command entices you to do so. It seems like the most exquisite idea in the world as he says that. Yeah, well, then I gotta do it. Can't really do anything about it. <laughs> like, I got willpower out the wazoo, but I'm not a vampire. So you're, you're, you're fighting his influence? Yeah. 
Okay, make a willpower roll. Difficulty is going to be eight. So it's just straight willpower? Yep. Oh, make sure it's a private roll. This is it's mental. Yep. Perhaps you and I, he says. And he turns to look back at you. Hmm. You're a bit old for my taste, Diego. Although we could have been wonderful lovers once. Hmm. I still have yet to see that Spaniard body. Mm. But no, take the chalk. Take the chalk and sketch. I would see your brilliance. Go, go. And he reaches out animatedly to pluck a piece of chalk from the easel. And he pushes it into your hands. Show me your brilliance, Diego Vasquez de Sevilla. Go. We shall watch. And Venceslas pulls away from you. I will show you some of my plans for the Cathedral of Valladolid. Wonderful, wonderful. Saga, you've managed to shake off whatever came over you, and you, your, your mind is suddenly your own again as you realize you're standing in this room, and, and Venceslas doesn't seem to realize that... Yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not even going to, like, think about it. I'm just going to rush. I'm going to go. Go. Okay, and you, you turn <laughs> that, to run for the door? That takes over me, yeah. All right, and as you run for the door, and, and Diego turns to... Uh, what, what is Diego doing as you see uh, Saga making a break for it? He hopes that she makes it, but he begins drawing as he said he would. And as you run for the door, and and, uh, go ahead and describe that for you. What what are you doing? Me? Saga. Yes. Oh, well, she just, like, she she thinks about fixing the dress first, but then she's like, no, like, that doesn't matter right now. I can do it while I'm running. And she thinks a little bit about... um, the second time she miscarried because now she has a run in the stair again. Um, but she doesn't. She doesn't care. She just has to. She just has to go. She has to go. That's all that goes through her mind. So she's gonna go towards the door and just pull it and just go. And as you jerk open the door, you see a man. Surprisingly, not expecting to see anyone on the other side. Lord Giovanni strides into the room. You see that Mariana is on his arm, and he seems to take no note of you at all, Saga. Although he looks directly at Venceslas, who whirls around and looks, Lord Giovanni! Sire Venceslas, I had wondered where our guests had got to. And he looks to you, Saga. Ha- ha- Saga, what, what do you do as you, as you see Lord Giovanni now joining this room with Mariana I'm going to push past him and go. I don't care. And as you push past him and, and run, and Saga flees the scene, do you continue down the steps? Yep. And as she disappears and flees, and Saga exits the scene, we, we see Lord Giovanni look at Venceslas reprovingly. Venceslas! I think you are trying to have two bites at the apple tonight, aren't you? And Venceslas frowns his wrinkled face. You have been provided yours for this evening. Now, I have been given complaints, and we all know that there is someone here who would not take kindly to you having two for one. Hmm? Yes, of course, Lord Giovanni. Uh, Forgive me. I, I just... She was so supple and young. I could not... I know. Venceslas, you will be have to be happy with what has been provided for you this evening. Of course, Lord Giovanni, forgive me. <laughs> and he looks towards you, Diego. Diego, how are you, you taking this in? Diego pauses halfway through drawing a balustrade and looks at the both of them. He is still red-faced, but this time from fear. The way they're talking makes it sound like he's dinner. Claudius looks at you and smiles. What an interesting scribble, he says to you, and then turns to depart from the room, disappearing and closing the door behind him. Mariana, blank like a doll, following after him. The door shuts and Venceslas turns to look at you. Hmm. Well, now that we've been deprived of our Eve, I suppose I shall have to deal with Adam. 
Go on, continue to draw. And this Venceslas reaches up and he begins pulling off your tunic. Diego gulps hard, but not knowing what to do, he allows that to happen while he continues drawing. Venceslas is very surprisingly gentle in his pulling as he begins to pull your tunic away. He, he almost seems to do such in a way that it doesn't interfere with your drawing, and before you know it, you are bare of chest from the waist up. And then he circles away and picks up your wine glass that he had taken from you earlier and set just aside. And he lifts it beneath his nose as though to smell the bouquet of the wine. Ah, lovely, I see what you are doing here. And he points out, go ahead and make a dexterity crafts roll. Difficulty is going to be seven. You are understandably under difficult circumstances. No, 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 this is not all right, and this this is not right. And, and Venceslas begins criticizing you harshly with the stern tone of a tutor. And you remember your masters that were teaching you this craft before as you're reminded of them as he points out any flaw in your picture. And, and he, he, he'll even smudge it with his thumb contemptuously and say, again, and urge you onward to continue to sculpt and, and draw. As this progresses, Diego is getting ever more frustrated. He flexes his fist a few times, thinking that he might just turn around and backhand this man if, it's, if this goes on. Clearly, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Because what he's putting on this canvas is brilliance. I told you to sing for your supper, and you give me these scribbles? You call that great? You haven't the right to call yourself an artist. You're a disgrace, a pretender in the halls of the muses. But, and he grasps the back of your neck and pulls himself close, and you feel the tickle of his beard. Remember, I could make you great. I could show you such things, give you unimaginable wealth. Wouldn't you like that, Diego? He trembles a bit. I would. His fingertips are almost sensuous against your skin as he suddenly, with his other hand, hurls the wine at your feet and smashes the goblet. There are jagged shards all at your feet of the pewter goblet that is now on pieces on the floor. The shards bite into your feet. And then he begins urging you onward to continue to paint and he even at some point plucks a shard from the ground and begins cutting at your legs as you continue to paint he laughs and raves and urges you onward more more commitment commitment and pain that is what makes great art embrace your pain diego it glorifies the creator god created the earth in pain Mothers issue forth their get in pain. You must bring forth your art from the depths of pain. And he begins slashing at your face with the shard. I could make you great, but first your suffering must be even greater. And he begins dragging the shard over your back. And if any response at pain, he continues to urge you on you. What is Diego doing as this madman continues to rave? Diego's fearing for his life. He continues to draw. And as blood drips down your body and soaks your clothes, continue. At first he thought he could take this man, that clearly he was old and wouldn't be able to stand up to a, young, a man as young and virile as him, but as fast as this man is moving and with such force, he begins to doubt himself. And he works hard to draw a beautiful transept with a triumphal arch, one that will impress this master. And as you continue to draw and you, you, you carefully judge each line, hoping to please this man, hoping that he doesn't cut you again, the pain and the weakness from these cuts all over your body, your feet trample the shards 
beneath you and wounds cover your back and your legs and your neck and your arms. He doesn't touch your hands, though. Venceslas cuts you elsewhere, but never your hands. Senor. <laughs> More commitment, commitment and pain. <laughs> see, see what you have done. Look his fingers spattered in blood, smearing blood across your cheek and your beard, reaches up to grasp your face and turn your face to what you have in, what you have drawn to affix your eyes there. And he reaches up with a blood spattered finger and draws with his wrinkled finger along the lines, smearing your own blood there. See what you have created. This is greatness, Diego. And Diego does indeed look. Truly look. Study. Study. Look. Look. And his whispers and Diego's fear and horror and pain is what we see as the camera fades out. And we shift scene. We follow Saga as we shift scene to her. She is running down the stairs. Saga, you've just escaped that horrible room with that lecherous old man. You are fleeing down the stairs, but you don't know where to go. The camera is going to follow you. Go ahead and describe us. Describe for us what Saga is doing. Well, when she reaches the foot of the stairs, she's gonna like correct her dress while she's trying to figure out how to get back to the main hall. She's angry now. You flee down the stairs, and it's not easy to run down a spiral staircase. That's the first thing you discover. Not only the twisting of the staircase, but also the uneven terrain forces you to take each step. For if you fell and tumbled and twisted an ankle, then you would be truly helpless in this place, and that fills you with even more terror. But you do manage to reach the bottom of the staircase in the hallway with which Winchestless escorted you to his chambers. And for a moment, you look around, make a wits, no, make an intelligence investigation roll to see if you can remember your way back. Wait. Difficulty will be seven, you're in a panic. Go fucking shitty. Yeah. You realize with absolute horror that you have no idea how to get back. It's hallways and doors and arches and stone-faced gargoyles looming at you all over. The camera focuses in on Saga as she begins to panic. What is she doing? She's gonna start walking. That's the only thing she can do. And as you walk down these long hallways, that are stretching onward. This is a very large manor house indeed, and you walk in what you think is perhaps the right direction. And yet, after some time, minutes perhaps, you see a figure at the end of the hallway emerging into your vision, and you see lit by the tapers that she, yes it is a she, is cloaked and wearing a man's breeches, and you remember earlier before she was introduced as Lady Demetra. Now are we lost? Her voice carries down the hallway and stops you dead in your tracks. Something in her tone causes you to stop, like startled prey. I was trying to find my way back to the main hall, my lady. I have some tro chosen words for the people attending indeed I would have thought a daughter of Uppsala would be able to find her way direction runs in your blood child there's something very serene about her face and you are reminded almost of the mother Mary with her hood up that way almost like the wimple of a nun and her face placid and serene as she 
walks down the, uh, the hallway towards you. You see her approaching you with every step. And then she finally reaches you within a few feet of you. And her eyes tense in indignation. I saw you leave with Venceslas. Did that old lecher put his hands upon you? He did, but I am not one to play victim. I thought not. You have the look of Scandinavia about you. I have been not, I've not been to Svithjord in many, many moons. Are you fond of hunting? I have not been allowed to hunt much. That was more of a pastime of my brother's, but I was allowed to follow, yes. And did you watch? Did you savor the chase and the kill? I... I believe that my prey has been more human than animal. I do not see how this has anything to do with the situation. Oh, don't worry. Venceslas is an old lecher. An old deviant. Do pay no mind to him. Oh, a queen does not cry when a peasant touches her. She strikes back. <laughs> so does a cornered animal. And something about that sends a chill through your spine. If you do... Excuse me, my lady, Dave. I'd like to get back. I can show you back. She reaches out a hand, offering a hand to you. He it very hesitantly. You find her hand is very cool to the touch as you take her, her hand into yours, and, or rather, she takes yours into hers, and closes her fingers around your trembling hand, still a fright from what had happened earlier. Lady Demetra quickly escorts you along, and the two of you walk through the hallways, the flickering tapers of the light illuminating her face. And you see just hints of her face. Most of it is obscured by the hood that she is wearing. These narrow walls and cramped ceilings are poor surroundings. After the endless expanse of the wilds, I can only imagine Uppsala in all its glory. As I said, I have not been there many moons. Well, Uppsala is the capital of knowledge more than the capital of nature. Mm, perhaps it is now. But in years past, in nights past, it was something quite different. You have the look of a trapped animal about you. I hope you don't mind me saying so. You look as though these surroundings do not do you well. You yearn for freedom, don't you? I must admit, milady, you were more correct in your wording than you can imagine. I knew I had that sense about you. But I bit the man, so one would argue that is one stick to the queen. <laughs> and it she... did not pierce the skin, which was odd. Demetra looks at you with something resembling admiration looking you up and down. Indeed. Well, that old lecher is much tougher than he looks, I think, but never mind him. Let's say you, we climb the roof of this place and get out into some open air. Get out of these secluded walls. You don't really want to go back to that cramped basement they call a dining hall, do you? What if any of my companions are in a similar situation? Do you care so much for them? Demetra asks, not accusingly, just mildly interested. A pack leader. Or is that not? Oh, I'm sorry, Emily, you're cutting out again. Go ahead and try and say that again. Oh. A pack leader cares for its pack, but does it not? Oh, you suppose you are the Alpha. You tend to be. Perhaps. Would you be willing to show me that? How would I go about doing that? Come along. 
Lady Demetra leads you off down the hall in an altogether different direction. Do you go with her? I guess. I don't want to be left alone again. She guides you along and you find yourself climbing another set of spiral stairs in much different circumstances now, arm in arm with Lady Demetra as she guides you along with her serene face and her cloak like a whisper across the stone steps spiraling upward and as you ascend and you walk you break into the first breath of fresh air sweet like freedom and suddenly you are claustrophobia at these surroundings like a cat like a cow being herded into the pen it suddenly comes to the fore and you realize that freedom is just up ahead how does saga react to the direction they're going in that breath of fresh air are we going outside? I've Did been you... requesting a breath of fresh air since we've got here. And now you shall have it, Lady Demetra says, softly, guiding you along, although not as lecherous or as seductively or as odiously as Vincheslas did. This has been quite your night. I've never had this agenda using me as a boy. Lady Demetra smiles but remains silent, and as you ascend the staircase and emerge, you find yourself on a battlement at the top of the manor, and you, the, the, the doorway gives way into the wilds of the Carpathian surroundings, and you see the mountain in the distance and the moon hanging over the shape of the jagged mountains far in the distance, and you breathe in the fresh air that carries on the wind that whips your dress back somewhat, emerging into the cold battlements, and you see there is the roof of the manor house just to the just to your left. One could easily climb up onto the roof if they so chose, and Lady Demetra indeed does, as she almost casually leaps up onto one of the crenellations and stalks with her hunting cloak like a whisper across the what roof he, behind you. What are you doing? Hmm. She breathes in the fresh air and stretches her arms. It is so much better out here, don't you agree? And she lowers her hood, and you see her long auburn hair and her face serene. A woman in her somewhat thirties, maybe. As she divests herself of her cloak and casts it off and you see her for the first time lean and athletic and powerful and there's some part of you that just stops and takes her in there's something about her that captivates you I do not dare to tread where you have treaded my lady no come then and she reaches down offering a hand to you to climb the roof This is most unusual. She's gonna take her hand anyway. And though she doesn't guide you, she forces you to climb on your own, but she does hold your hand as you ascend to the roof and the sharp slope underneath your feet, and she walks with you up to the top of the roof, and you see, you overlook everything. There's horribly steep plummets off the side of this uh, manor house built into the craggy crenellations of the of the mountainside as it is and you see one or two men perhaps of Giovanni's long below on the walls where you had come in you see the carriage and for the first time you are out in the open and you breathe the air as it whips over you and Lady Demetra stretches and she looks at you with glittering eyes as the moonlight bathes the two of you isn't it so much better here, out in the open? Look up at the moon, see her beauty. All of this wilderness, she looks around. Seeing the moon always makes me think of wolves. <laughs> Let us play a game, then. I will be the wolf, and you will... As she begins to smile, 
you see something very unnatural about her as her fangs begin to elongate her teeth growing long and sharp and her eyes suddenly are aglow like a demon bright and as luminous as the moon and you shall be the deer I'm a lady. I'm afraid I do not know how to play this game. Run! She says in a low growl, a very unladylike growl, as she cuffs you suddenly across your chest, knocking you to the floor of the roof up there high, as suddenly Vertigo spins as you threaten, make a quick dexterity athletics roll to grab the roof or threaten to tumble off. Dexterity and... Athletics. athletics. Difficulty seven. Um, that's that's a physical roll, don't worry. Mhm. Mm Public. Yeah. Let's just dive. Nope. You scrabble and grab and try to take hold of the roof, but you find yourself tumbling down. Go ahead and describe Saga and her distress as she begins to tumble towards that endless abyss down at the foot of the roof. She, um, I mean, it's like her heart is not even beating anywhere. It's not beating fast, it's just not beating. And uh, there's no sound. She can't hear anything but the wind going past her ears and she tries to grab and scrabble for just anything, anything. Suddenly, moving faster than you, your eye can follow, you, you, you don't see her, the world is spinning, and suddenly a hand grabs you by your shoulder and keeps you from plummeting to the ground, and you are hurled upward to the roof, and you spin your hands, slapping the slats of the roof as your body tumbles upward from the force of the throw. You are hurled upwards, up on your feet! You hear her yell, Run! I get up and I fucking run. Go ahead and make a dexterity athletics roll as you flee across the roof of this manor house. Difficulty seven? Uh, yes, the ground is very uneven. Nope. As you run, you see... You can't help but look back and see her her form crouched like an animal, very unlike a woman now, as her legs scissor and she sprints after you, her fangs and eyes alight. And you suddenly collapse. As Saga collapses, what does she does is this predator is atop her now, sure to catch her. Um, she's gonna try to get up again, that's all she can do. And as you struggle and dreams over you and you see her shadow against the moon, only the glow of her eyes looking down at you as she reaches down and cuffs you across the face again. Why won't you run? Get up! Get up! Give me a chase! And she hits you again and again until you struggle to rise. Yeah, I'm gonna fucking kick her. And as you kick back, she continues to swing at you, continues to cuff you until you rise. Do you fight her, or do you try to rise to rise to your feet? I try to fight her. Okay, go ahead and describe that for us. Well, Sokka is kind of pissed right now, because she was in the situation she was in, and now she's in this situation. Just assuming she started trusting somebody, so she can feel the rage just welling. And she's gonna try to... Is there anything she can grab up there? Like a uh, tile no. or something? Uh, you, you can look for a loose tile if, if you look around, at, you know, perception, alertness, difficulty nine, sure. All right, no. Then I'm going to just try to kick her again. And as you kick at her and you kick out at her, she snatches up your ankle and she grips you at the base of your ankle. Do you, do you try to resist her? Of course I'm going to try to resist her. Alright, go ahead and make your strength athletics roll. Or no, it'll be strength brawl. You're grappling with her. Yeah. What's 
difficulty? Oh, six. Always six against contested. One success. She effortlessly overpowers you, gripping your ankle and dragging you across the the roof of the manor house. And as she drags you like the carcass of a deer, you think, your head bumping against the slats, your cheek bruised, dragging you to the edge. She grips you by your ankle, brings you to the edge of the roof. And you see downward, hundreds and hundreds of feet down, spiraling out into darkness. You can just see the mists of the top of the trees as you look down and you are suddenly yanked out of the roof and she reaches out by a single hand to suspend you by your ankle over the chasm as the world spins and you flail, suspended above the deep. What does Saga do is she is held out before certain death by this woman, her ankle tense with pain under her grip. Well, considering she's probably going to die anyway, she's just going to yell at her. Do it! Just do it! I'm tired of running from you monsters! <sighs> there is a very disappointed look as Lady Demetra looks you over. This monster, this demon with her eyes aglow as she begins swinging you back and forth, threatening to let go. Make a courage roll, difficulty nine. Straight up courage? Yep. Is that hidden or open? Uh, open. No, actually hidden, yeah. Okay. So you have, you've botched completely you yep. you completely lose all nerve as she threatens to let you go and all of your courage against this demon goes out against you go ahead and describe that for us the saga completely loses herself she um, she faints I think. oh no you're still quite conscious oh. you don't have the luxury of fainting I, okay right um i think she just starts she'd start praying to loki Give us more. Is she is she screaming? Is she fighting? Is she kicking? She she's praying. She's praying like she's gonna die. Mm-hmm. And, and it, she she's you know she's uh she's closing her eyes because she can't take what she's seeing right now, and she's just so sure that she's gonna die. But at least she won't have died as you know as a coward in her eyes. And Demetra, you hear her say, "That's better." And then hurled by your ankle, a shriek un involuntarily ripped from your throat, interrupting your prayers as you are hurled back across the roof as you are let go and flung, tumbling like a sack. You are bruised and battered and full of fear and terror as adrenaline races through you as you collapse on the roof and you finally find your bearings as the world stops spinning and you look up and you see Demetra standing there as the wind whips up and carries her hair out behind her, a figure standing perched on the edge of that roof looking at you with glowing eyes. If you run, you still might manage to get away. And you see her fingers begin to become claws. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I botched that roll pretty badly, so she's gonna start running again. Okay, go ahead and describe it for us. What's what's going through Saga's mind as as she sees this? Like, this is this is horrifying. Well, I mean, she uh, she's from Scandinavia, and uh, that kind of stuff about about werewolves and shit is still very much, you know, a part of the lore that people tell their children about going out at night. So she thinks this is a werewolf. And as. Saga turns to flee, shrieking. Is she is she screaming or is she is she silent? She's just silent and completely pale, even on their lips at this point. 
she probably would have lost her her veil as well, so her red hair is just... Oh, that's long gone, yeah. Yeah. And her red hair flows behind her as we see, and the camera pulls away, and we see the two figures sprinting across the rooftop, and we see Demetra chasing after her. And that is what we see as the scene fades outward. We shift scene from the top of the roof of Giovanni's Manor down into the very bowels, deep, deep into the earth, deep beneath the banquet hall, and into the darkness where Lady Theophana has taken a taper and is leading Giulietta de Florence along. Giulietta, you're descending stairs behind Lady Theophana. She's leading the way, this slender, wild girl who is not yet quite a woman, although perhaps in some places she might be, leading down into the darkness. And you can't help but feel something eerie as you descend into the dark. It's down here, she whispers. The game. The game of price. Julieta um, is somewhat freaked out as she's looking around, and and it seems to be getting darker and darker as they descend, and um, her eyes lift up as she hears Lady Theophana speak of of where they're going and and she's not quite sure where she's leading her where are we going my lady oh just a ways just a ways down into your head maybe into my head (laughs) no just this way come it's utterly dark down here and if not for the taper that lady theophana was carrying you wouldn't be able to see at all Groping against the stone walls, Julietta, you feel your way along down into the darkness deeper and deeper until the temperature of the air drops and a chill rises against the fine hairs on your neck and your cheek. You emerge into the blackness of a room just beyond and you feel it as the stairway gives way into the openness of a room and all you can see is Lady Theophana following after her, smelling like a freshly opened grave with her rotting flowers and soil on her pale skin. Like a ghost, she carries that taper, a single light against the blackness that is all pervasive and around you. You whirl around as if to look back, as if to reassure yourself there was a way back, and yet you can't see where you would come. You are standing in nothing but pitch blackness, with only her light to lead your way. Um... Julietta definitely can feel her heart. It's, it's pounding in her chest. And she um, is very unsure of everything at this point. Um, but she plays along. And, and as she follows this, this young girl, um, she, she looks to the back of her head and she speaks up once more. I would like to see what is in that head of yours, she says. And... and um, She tries her absolute best to stay composed as she speaks again of how you hold that confidence with Lord Giovanni. Oh, you might not, she says cryptically and glancing back at you with a faint smile. There's something eerie about her smile, ghostly. As she turns back around and continues to lead you on, you see vague shapes around you draped in silks and cloth shapes in the dark that you bump into and follow after her finally Lady Theophana places the taper down and you see a very large table that is where she had placed the light of course and it glows softly and she circles around the table and, and you see by the light of the taper 
velvet cushions just beyond where you can see. Lady Theophana trods upon them with her bare feet, still dirty, dirty as the rest of her ripped gown. And so, here we are. You can't see because this is where you are inside yourself, in, in your head, up here. And she points to her temples. See, we are alone, all alone, just you and me together. And we're going to play a game, the price of survival, price of what's valuable. Because I see you, Lady Julieta, you are a phony, a fake. You are not here for Lord Giovanni. You are here for... She trails off, looking at you, as though she could look right through you and read your very thoughts. Um, Julieta is definitely given pause to this moment. She, she, as much as she's getting frustrated with this game they are playing, um, perhaps she must go a different route with this this young woman and eventually her face kind of um takes on a stony like almost icy like features as she looks to lady theophana and she lifts her chin as she speaks yes perhaps you are correct i do come here of my own volition but also to garner something make a courage roll difficulty six Is this private? Yep. Okay. To your credit, you managed to keep your voice from trembling as you say that. Lady Theophana smiles. And she leans down wordlessly to grope in the darkness and for a moment disappears out of the sphere of light from that single taper. And she emerges with an animal in her arms. You see a cat that she is holding, gently stroking between the ears. The cat doesn't resist her. Hmm. And then her other hand dips up out of the blackness and you see, you see she is holding a very large meat mallet. She tilts her head and looks at you from over where she holds the cat to her chest. Would you care to bludgeon the cat, Julietta? Would I care to, my lady? No, of course not. <clears throat> but she she pauses for a moment. She knows that she's playing with fire at this point. She sees that this there's something dark in this woman, and she she does not want to go there, but she also is desperate to get close to Lord Giovanni and if this is the only way then she does step forward hmm such a shame she looks down at the cat and continues stroking it and and then ups her offer seemingly placing the mallet on the table reaching out into the blackness and then producing what you can see by the light of the taper a shiny golden coin stamped in the Venetian style you recognize it immediately Perhaps for a gold coin, you would legend the cat. Hmm? You do need money, don't you? Now that you're free of the Medici. And Lady Theophana tilts her little chin down and looks up at you from the hollows of her eyes. How, how do you know that? I followed your head crumbs. She continues to scratch the cat, who has begun to purr contentedly in her arms. Kitty, kitty, won't you smash his brains, Lady Julietta? For a coin, here. She holds out the coin, daintily, by two fingers. Take it. I do not need 
Gold, my lady, I need favors. Oh, but we all need gold to survive. And she withdraws the coin, however. We all need gold. With gold, you could buy mercenaries. You could buy men. Men even enough to take your son back. She looks up at you from over the top of the cat. And a devilish smirk pulls at the corner of her lips. Men to assault the Medici mansion. I know. She turns around and reaches off into the blackness and withdraws what appears to be a black satin bag, heavy. And she opens the neck of the bag and pours the gold that spills out onto the table before you. Ooh, look at all that gold. She smiles. And you indeed, look, it is quite quite a bit of wealth, enough for you to disappear somewhere into some kingdom, although certainly not enough to challenge your former patron. Would you bludgeon the cat for all of this gold? Um, Julietta, at the mention of her son, she kind of, there's a small part of her that, that wilts. Um, her, her facial expression um, twists into a- almost horror. Um, she, she doesn't know how this woman knows so much about her. She doesn't even know this woman. Um, and she swallows a dry lump that's kind of formed in her throat. Um, and she takes a step back, uh, looking over at the gold and at the cat, and she says... I do not wish to play these games anymore. Oh, you need more. I know what you need. I know what you need. Theofana wiggles her index finger at you. You don't need a mere bag of gold. You need something more substantial. She places the cat atop the table. The cat circles on the table as though looking for somewhere to go, but coming to one edge and then to the other. Stopping, the cat settles down atop the gold coins, its black fur, sharp contrast against the glittering yellow. Lady Theofana turns and whirls around in the darkness, and she disappears. And suddenly you're alone, Julietta, you're alone, and your vision swims as though you can't see quite well, as though the taper is getting dimmer, your vision is getting blurrier, you're not sure what's happening, but you blink against it. Is she noticing that she keeps disappearing and reappearing? Like, is she taking note of this? Yes, but it doesn't uh, It doesn't appear to be obviously supernatural. She just vanishes into the darkness and then reemerges. Okay, so it's just creepy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Theofana emerges out of the darkness after a moment, and before your very eyes, you see one of the most beautiful young men you have ever seen. He's, he's youthful and, and completely naked. That is also a thing you notice. His manhood is very prominent and very impressive. He's a very picture of youth. He's wearing nothing at all. Theofana is guiding him along out of the blackness. And you see his lovely face and his eyes just staring off into the blackness as though not seeing anything. (laughs) This boy man she reaches down and grabs his cock into her hand and then releases it he is very adept at pleasure even love isn't he comely her gentle young hand stroke over his body hard and well defined so much better than all those fat old men you're used to fucking he could love you I could make him love you You may have the use of her, his charms, forever. Just hit the cat. And she reaches over and grabs the mallet and holds it out to you. Strike the cat once. Just hit it as hard as you can on the head. And he is yours. True love. Julietta is, her breathing starts to get heavy as she's feeling very trapped and very claustrophobic and she she looks to the cat and to lady theophana and, and the naked the naked boy standing beside her and she just 
She starts taking steps back. You are ridiculous, she says, and she turns as she's about to leave. Wait! And something in Theovana's voice stops you. Something in her tone. You don't know why you wait, but you do. You stop. All of the muscles in your legs suddenly go slack and you you stop. You stand there. You command your legs to carry you away from this place, but they don't listen to you. You can only stand there and look at her and wait. Theophana smiles. And as you had turned away from her and as you look back, you see the boy is suddenly gone. He's not there anymore. You tantalize me. I have never beheld one who is so formidable a challenge. I give you one final offer, Julieta. A chance to have everything, even more than Lord Giovanni could have offered you. And you, Julieta de Florence, would have the power to get your son back. I recently inherited a duchy in Austria. I care not for the climate, and I will soon give it away. You may have it. The land, the treasury, the levies, and the title of duchess. In return, she points at the table. For one cat. Take the mallet. Beat the cat. Bash its brains out. And you can have it all! Isn't it exciting? You're so lucky. I'm offering this to you. How am I to know you're not just lying to me? I am Lady Theophana. I am privy to far more than you could ever imagine here. And from somewhere within the folds of her torn dress, she produces a rip or a, uh, a shiny golden ring. See the seal of the duchy. And she holds it out to you. Um, Julietta would look down at it and to make sure it's real, she would reach out. She wants to see it. Go ahead and roll your perception and etiquette. I'll give it, I'll give it to you, etiquette, because you've seen other rings like it. Is this normal dice? Yep. It looks real. You've seen many rings like it before, and yet you beheld this ring, and you imagine it on your fingers. You imagine being the duchess of this place in Austria. You've never been to Austria before, but you think perhaps you and your son could grow to like it. And for a moment, her offer seems very real. Just one cat. What use is one cat over your son? Over independence, over freedom? When you look up, you see she is holding out the mallet to you. Julieta kind of turns, um, turns it over in her, her fingers and she's examining it. Um, and when she mentions her son, she looks up sharply. I would do anything for my son, she says. Um, but then she looks down at the mallet and, and then over at the cat. Um, there's so many thoughts running through her mind at this point, and she looks back to Lady Theophana and she says, Why is it so important for you to see me beat a cat? We were discussing price and the value of life, weren't we? Go on, show me. Show me what you would do to save your son. Good kitty. She reaches out and strokes the cat between its ears. So unknowing of what's coming. Go on, Julieta. She pulls her hand back and steeples her fingers, bringing them before her lips. Go on. She grabs the mallet, um, she takes it from her, um, and she steps forward close to the table, but she looks back at the lady and says, 
I am guaranteed of this duchy. Theophana smiles and nods very quickly. Julietta is... She knows this sounds ludicrous. I mean, she's going to kill a cat, and this woman's going to give her an entire duchy and the wealth that it brings. I mean, it's very far-fetched, but at this point, if this is all she's going to get from this woman, since she's not seemingly able to, you know... It doesn't seem as though, I should say, that she's going to help her with Lord Giovanni. Um, this is this is the best she's going to get at this point. And it's a very good offer, believe me. Uh, it's It intrigues her beyond anything else. But, you know, it is not in her nature to, to kill anything. She never has before. But there is something that drives her, and that is her son. And she eventually will step forward and and swallow another very hard lump that is formed in her throat. She reaches for the cat. The cat seems completely unaware of what's coming for it. Go ahead and describe what we see as Julietta reaches for the cat. Um, she grasps at its neck um, and she feels the, the warm you know, soft fur underneath it and and for a moment she she remembers back to when she was a child and and how a lot of the stray cats um, on the streets that were near her home uh, would come to her house when she was very, very little. Um, and her father would, you know, would feed them their scraps and and the memory is just so quick in her mind and it and it flickers there for a moment, but she quickly banishes it away and and she pushes the cat down on the table and she takes the mallet and she raises it. And her chest starts to hurt a moment, and she it's almost as though she's beating that memory away, but she slams the mallet down on the cat's head. And she just keeps doing it. She just, again and again and again, and I'm assuming blood begins to s- swirl out of the cat's ears and the mouth and, and where the mallet is slamming down on the wound. As Julietta hammers away at the cat furiously... Lady Theophana begins to giggle and cry, a gleeful cry, and clap, and continue to urge you on. Oh, yes, oh, yes, more, more. And the kitty, the cat, yelps and screams and twists under the first two blows, but then it goes limp as you continue to beat it in its brains. Coins go everywhere with the force of the blow, and so does the blood that spatters your face as you hammer furiously on the carcass of the now still cat. Uh, after she does this for several minutes, she eventually, her, her breath is hard and she's, <sighs> and just the, every emotion possible just wells up inside of her. And eventually she, she tosses the mallet to the side and takes, takes a staggering step backwards, the blood all over her hands. And even some of it splattered on her face from this cat. the ruined mess that used to be this cat its entrails hanging off the off the table its organs splayed everywhere its brain and its head smashed into nothing a matted bloody carcass laying amidst the glittering gold coins you see Theophana emerge from the darkness glee on her face. Well done, Duchess. Well done. That was exhilarating to watch. Thank you so much for that. Oh, but there is one more thing. And she reaches out and grabs your hand. Does Julietta resist her as she pulls her off into the darkness, picking up the taper? She does not. She's... She's so entranced at this point, and um, every emotion imaginable is just kind of like welling inside of her, and she's shaking, and her chest is heaving, and she just literally follows Lady Theophana after that. With the wet, warm, quickly cooling blood of the cat dripping from your face still, you follow after her, pulled endlessly on, and suddenly the ground as it slopes down, begins to give way as you see 
an open earthen chamber begin to open up in this room as it dips down and you see where the floor has been ripped away from the stone and you see a coffin there as she alights the room with the taper holds it high over the coffin and a shovel and you see a grave that has been dug Lady Theophana walks forward and she opens the lid of the coffin and you see a bound and gagged servant from earlier, one of the women, gagged there. Hmm. See here? And Lady Theophana pulls the shovel from the earth. Bury her alive. She holds out the shovel. Julietta um, tries to temper her her breathing at this point, and a slender brow raises as she looks over to Lady Theophana, almost aghast, but at the same time, it's a rather tempered expression, considering she just, you know, you know, killed a cat. <laughs> so, um, she she hesitates for a moment and then looks over to the the frightened servant that's tied up in this coffin and then she looks over to the hole and 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 you see that the her 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 trust blonde hair spattered with earth a dirty rag shoved in her mouth and her wide eyes full of fear she's she's shaking with fear as the sudden as, as the coffin lid had suddenly been opened up she had been plunged into darkness before then and now she is looking up at the two of you with theophana holding the taper in one hand and the shovel in the other You cannot be serious. Lady Theophana looks confused, her young face tightening. Why do you hesitate, Duchess? She's no more than a cat, after all. I did what you asked. Enough of these tricks. There's no trick, she smiles and holds out the shovel. You're a Duchess. What else would you require? What is your price? I will give you anything. Well, I have a question. Sure. Um, so, when you become a duchess back then, like, were, was there paperwork involved? Yeah, if... if- if she, I mean, there there are some laws that allow you to voluntary, voluntarily abdicate and give someone else a title. Yeah. Okay, so. But there is like, she, there is like. There needs to be like a paper trail. Go ahead and roll uh, intelligence academics difficulty eight to see if you can even focus your mind to be that rational in this moment. Okay. What is it? Intelligent academic. Yes, difficulty eight. And that's public? No, it's private. Oh. Gosh, I, I'm getting so confused with these public-private things. Anything mental is private. Did you get that? Nope. Oh, I rolled. Let me try to reload. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, you just barely managed to grasp something about some paperwork that, you know, maybe you should ask about at least. 
Um, after a moment, she looks back over to the poor serving girl who is like wide eyed and frightened and um, she hesitates. She, she knows that there's some sort of, um, there are laws about this. There's, there's paperwork that needs to be properly, um, filed and, and signatures that need to be signed in order for, for this to really happen for her. Um, and there is a small part of her that's like, you know, appalled that she's even, um, thinking this, you know, because she she has to bury this girl um in order to do it is it is it she's the Obana kind of... interrupts your train of thought and she see as as though she was following it as we're speaking out loud and she says i will take you upstairs to lord giovanni's chambers his study and we will sign everything the paperwork has already been prepared i just wanted to see if you would do it and you will won't you she's just a cat Theofana shoves the shovel at you, graven, this graven-haired child that is covered in rotting flowers and soil in her torn gown as she holds it out daintily to you. Go on. Um, Julietta, um, did she throw the shovel to her? No, she's just holding it out to you. Oh, okay. Um, Julietta hesitantly takes it um, and looks back over to the girl, and she... (laughs) She's shaking her head behind the gag in her mouth, looking up at you wild-eyed. Theofana's ignoring her. Why this girl, she says as she kind of takes a timid step forward. Why the cat? Theofana shrugs. That was a cat, she says. This is a young girl. What did she do? She's a cat. Theofana looks down into the coffin. Julietta looks angrily at her. Um, She's getting so frustrated with these answers that are non-answers um are you saying you won't do it theofana looks up at you and narrows her eyes would you do it this is not about me julietta um looks forward and just the the thought of her son comes into her mind and Eventually, that just wins over, and she steps forward. Make a conscience roll. Let's see if it wins over. Okay. Difficulty's always eight for conscience. That's a botch. Go ahead, Julietta. So did I did I botch? Like Yep, you botched. I mean, did I botch having a conscience or did I botch You botched having a conscience, yeah. Okay, so I am gonna do it then. Does that what that mean? Sorry, I just wanna get, get uh, it you, accurate. You made a conscience roll and you botched. You failed horribly at your conscience. Okay. But the train of thought is still the same though about her son. Is it? Uh, describe for us what's going on. Well, I mean, the thought is the fact that she, you know, this is about her son, and she, mm-hmm. um, and she loses herself in that moment. So the thought of this girl means nothing to her. Mm-hmm. Um, so she steps forward, and um, is the table like right on the edge, on the precipice of this hole? There's no table there, but there's a coffin. Like, right next to the hole? Yep. The, the, the grave's already dug. You just have to close the coffin lid and push her in. Well, that's what she does. She steps forward, and um, she looks down at the girl, and, and the girl is obviously, you know, screaming. 
under the muffle. Um, and she only looks at her for, for a moment before shutting the coffin. And before um, you can react, Theofana quickly rushes you and she grabs the shovel from you and she flings open the coffin lid and said, it's my turn. She wails loudly, my turn. And she brings the shovel down onto the servant's face and blood immediately explodes inside the coffin as she bashes the servant's brains in and continues (gasps) hammering on the servant's face. Julietta falls backwards and and her she covers her mouth and gasps. <laughs> My turn. She continues to keep hammering this servant in the face with the shovel. And you see her heels drumming at the foot of the coffin, her hands tapping, shaking in a death shake with death rattles that shake through her as convulsions come over her dying body. Theofana pauses, spattered in blood, covering the with the blood and brain and hair that hangs off the end of the shovel she turns and looks at you and smiles and you see her fangs as she reaches out to grab you come join the kitty join the kitty duchess and she grabs you by your hair do you fight her um julietta screams out in horror as this woman takes hold of her and 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 she she does see her fangs yes yes absolutely I mean, it's clear as day. This this is not a woman. This is a monster. Yep. And she is so frightened. She immediately, when she's grabbed, puts her hands up and tries to push away from her. All right, strength brawl. Difficulty six. Uh, that was a physical role, so you can do that publicly next time. But yeah, uh, Lady Theofana effortlessly overpowers you and grabs you by your hair, pulling you, dragging you along the soil, staining your dress as she yanks you up and throws you into the coffin atop the corpse that is still convulsing. And you look down, you find yourself on your belly, Julietta, looking down into the ruined mess of her face as she convulses. And Theofana slams the coffin lid shut. You'll smell of death afterwards. And she kicks, pushes, and pulls the coffin in with a large crash and a thud. You are down in the grave. What is Julietta doing as she's forcibly pushed into the coffin atop this this convulsing corpse? Oh, she's screaming. She's, no, no, she's screaming. And she, she's, you know, she feels this dead corpse underneath her. She's completely freaked out. She tries, she can't even move. I mean, there's no, she can't move. That She's in a tight-knit coffin. So she just kind of like tries to maneuver her hand up and she's slamming her hand, at least the one that's free, up against the coffin and she's yelling, help, help, help. And she's screaming and she is just terrified. And then as you continue to hammer and pound upon the lid of the coffin, you hear the wrenching of the coffin lid shutting, the iron grinding, and the pattering of earth as Theofana begins burying you. And that is the end of that scene, and that's also the end of uh, our session for today, guys. Um, so the camera fades out, and that's that's going to be it for now. Um, Everybody had their their interactions. Uh, I I thought we were going to get to the embrace today. Probably not going to be this week now, um, but we're definitely going to do it next week. So how did uh, feedback time basically? As everyone's left in the wake of that horrifying scene, um, what did everybody think of sort of these uh, these vignettes that we did today? You know, the interactions with with the uh, your hosts and. Uh, you know, the, the challenges faced by your characters. I'm going to be right back and go to the bathroom. I'll be back. Okay, cool. My character better be a duchess. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't count on it. 
Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> I do not know. I do not know what Wolfish was, ex was ex expecting when she was dragging me out there. Like, I don't know. Like, do I look strong? No, I don't. Like, I don't know what she was expecting me to do. She wanted you to run. Like, I can talk a big game, but I'm like, I'm not physical. Like, you can see it on me. Damn. Yeah, from all appearances, she just wanted you to run from her. Yeah. No, I no, I get it. I'm just saying, like, my character, you know, she she talks. She doesn't, you know, do physical shit. <laughs> so, that was bound to fail. I don't know how she thought that would be a good change. What do yeah. you think, Daniel? Uh, well...